pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I know we're going to have a lively discussion tonight. Uh, we have been going back and forth in the chat here about some of the things we intend to discuss with you this evening. And um, I think that it's going to get <laughs> it's going to get interesting because uh, as I was just remarking, literally when Ben said you got five seconds. Um, we are going to earnestly contend for the faith this evening concerning the doctrine of eternal security, which we believe is also directly connected, tied to, and tethered with this the concept of Christians being demon-possessed, okay? And so we're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Sister Angel's getting fired up. She's warming up the fire, getting ready for the heat she's about to bring on this topic. And I'm looking forward to it because she's ready to go. And then also Sister Victoria is with us again this evening. Praise the Lord. She's going to get a little scrappy on this, I know. <laughs> uh, she's ready to go on this, as is Ben. And this Ben is, like I said, he's often my, my silent uh, co-host here because he doesn't like to talk too much. Most men don't. You know, they did a study a long time ago about how I don't remember if it was women use twice as many words or three times as many words as men. Mostly, you know, ladies, we know it's true. They're sitting over there going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. So, um, but when they got something to say, right, when they're excited about something they want to talk about, you can't shut them up. And tonight, that might be the case with Ben. He has a few points he wants to make, and we might have to go, <clears throat> Ben, oh, we got to get back to him. No. I'm hoping that'll be the case because I love it when he talks and he starts extrapolating on things because he brings the heat too. He doesn't just timidly do his research. He'll get down and dirty. And I like that about him. So those are my three guests for tonight. Sister Renee, wish she could have been here with us this evening. Uh, shout out to you, Sister Renee, if you're listening. I know you wanted to be here. She's here in spirit and she's rooting for us out there. Thank you so very much on this topic because this one is, um, hmm. It's kind of like a hot fire of embers <laughs> when you deal with it. Because I remember about 40-ish, 45-ish years ago when this doctrine entered the church. And one of the people we're going to talk about tonight was one of the, not the only, but one of the people who you could say you could lay at the feet of them, this concept of Christians and demon possession. So um, we're going to tackle some of that, and we're going to show why it is actually even linked to eternal security and why they're attacking eternal security when they say that Christians can be demon possessed. Okay, so we're going to deconstruct this and then we think reconstruct it based upon the scripture on how to properly explain demonic activity in a Christian's life. Okay. Um, so without any further delay, I'm going to introduce my panel. Uh, panel, they're not panel. They're my friends. So I'm going to introduce Ben, the man of few words, also the producer. Also keeps everything together. 
I told you guys, and I mean it, I'd be lost without him because OBS and I don't get along. And Ben is really good at it. Brother Ben, would you like to say hello this evening? And hello, everyone. It's good to be here uh, once again. I think we have a really interesting topic. And there's a lot of, um, well, there shouldn't be, uh, but there's a lot of uh, false doctrine around it. Um, and I think I hope to cut right through it all and get to the heart of the matter, uh, which is the truth. And I think we'll, we'll do, do, do just that. Praise the Lord. Also with me tonight, I'm going to go last to um, uh, Sister Angel because she's going to take it away when she's uh, after I introduce her. But um, Sister Victoria, I was teasing her in one of our last conversations together. I got a nickname for her. I hope she won't mind if I share it here. Would you mind if I share it here, Sister Victoria? That's fine. That's fine. I, I I I first was teasing her and called her a scrappy puppy, but then I found out her love for cats, so I ended up chained into scrappy cat, which I think fits her. <laughs> um, and what I meant by that was that she's very, you know how kittens are like really soft, or even puppies are so soft and playful, but then, you know, when you're playing with them and they start biting you and they get a little scrappy, you know, they got a little fight in them, she's like that. And if you get her on one of those topics that she's like, this is false doctrine. You will hear it in her voice, man. She's, she'll just get fired up. And I love it when she does that. So I'm introducing my friend, Sister Victoria, my scrappy cat friend. How you doing, Sister Victoria? Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me back, Lisa. I'm looking forward to the topic tonight because it needs to be addressed. I'm having issues with that even in my life, in my women's Bible study I have at my house, people, believers thinking that um, we could still be possessed, which I totally disagree with. So I'm looking forward to what everyone has to say tonight. So hopefully yes. it'll be awesome. And thank you. <laughs> See how soft she talks, but don't get her fired up about something. Then. Look out. <laughs> my dad was unwavering on this particular topic. You know, when I was growing up, once my parents got saved, I saw as a child that the transition that they made from literally watching their personalities change to, you know, from things they used to do. And they were never like, they weren't like dark people or deep into the world. They were never connected in that regard, but they had their things that they did that you would, you would call worldly, okay, that they cast aside when they got saved. And I saw the change in my parents. And one thing was just amazing to me about my dad was I don't ever remember until he uh, started having some health issues at the end of his life. I never saw my dad have a day that he was not in the Bible. Never. I can't even think of a day. So, I mean, I remember I would come to the door sometimes to his bedroom and he'd be laying across the bed and he'd lay on his stomach and he'd have the Bible in front of him, pillow up under him, pen in his mouth, and he'd be studying and he'd have some lexicons and stuff out and he'd be studying. And I'd say, hey, Pop, can I talk to you for a second? And he'd take the pen out of his mouth and he'd toss it in the Bible, close, close the book he was reading. And yeah, what, what you want? I mean, always, that's just, that was my dad. But when I talked to him about this, we, we had a conversation about the Christians and demon possession, and he, he was vociferous on this. And my father was a mild-mannered type of guy, unless you got him fired up about the word. <laughs> so on this, he was unwavering. He was like a Christian, a born-again believer, cannot be demon-possessed. And he explained to me why. And so I've always held that view. Now, we're going to talk about some of the other ways that demonic activity can appear in a Christian's life or have influence upon them. But possession from within, none of us believe that mess because there's evidences that we're going to point to not only in the scripture, but also in, in, in life experiences and things that we're going to share with you this evening. 
So I'm introducing my last buddy here on the panel, which is Sister Angel Martin. She has a channel by the same name. If you guys haven't checked out her channel, I would encourage you because she comes from a very different perspective. And the things that she shares, I mean, they're just awesome. Because I grew up being a believer. I don't even remember a time that I didn't believe in God. So her perspective is completely different. I'm always fascinated and always love to hear people who are converted that come from either different faiths or uh, no faith at all and how they became believers. I just love listening to their testimonies. I could listen for hours because it, it's just it, they literally in their testimony show you the handiwork of God in their life and how he convinced them as to who he is. Not was, because we serve a living God. Amen. So Sister Angel, go ahead and take it away. Start wherever you want to start on this topic. Well, you know, um, sorry, I was, I was actually just uh, getting uh, the Bible verses lined up in my, in my Bible here. I couldn't find a highlighter, so I was having, oh, I hate having to write in it or fold the pages instead of highlighting but anyway so because i have i think i have like a a pretty good like uh three point uh case that sh you know in terms of verses that prove that this is ridiculous um and there's there's a lot more but this is just for me to me this is what this is what did it for me like what settled it i knew it in my heart already uh for, like it was a foregone conclusion from you know the time i ever believed in the first place because i, I got saved in the midst of dealing with an actual demon in my home um that you know was you know causing trouble and uh manifesting and it was attached to my friend and i've gone into that before um and uh <laughs> you know that was that was what was happening around me uh when i actually just you know that's how it has how it happened really because i saw i you know i saw the demon finally flee the name of jesus and the lord's prayer you know uh we had not resorted to anything biblical for you know on and off two years at that point i don't think either one of us wanted to find out that that it would work right and so you know it wasn't really a faith thing like oh it was just a you know power suggestion no i didn't want it to work as it was happening i didn't want to find out that that would be the thing that worked when nothing else had because it would have made me wrong uh it, it worked and so that's like you know what was happening when i got saved because that really just pushed me over the edge there was you know nothing else to conclude you know, this thing fled the name of Jesus. It was just case blows there for me. You know, Jesus is Lord. Bible's true. And um, <laughs> I uh, I had feared demonic possession my whole life as a little kid. Even though I didn't believe and I was, uh, you know, I would have said I was an atheist as a kid. Um, I somehow knew demons were real. Somehow, just like deep in my gut, knew that they were real. And my dad, like, a, ugh, like an idiot let me see the exorcist when I was four uh, and I was traumatized from that point on and I was very afraid of demonic possession so to me the notion that people think I don't know if they just take it very lightly or something or like they don't realize just like what a horrific idea it is that not only like can our believers not safe they're not protected which means no one's safe which means um there's nothing you can do whatsoever to, to, to like, you know, even ideally, I guess, I guess a lot of the people that teach this kind of crap, deliverance or Christians, they, they tell you that it's, you know, based on the sin in your life, that that's the level to which you're vulnerable to demons. And it's, it's, it's totally ridiculous. And think what a horrific idea that would be, you know, like, oh, am I sinning too much? Am I going to possibly be, you know, <laughs> vulnerable to demonic possession? Why would anybody ever want to to actually practice biblical deliverance in that case and risk getting demonically possessed by casting demons out of unsaved people, right? You wouldn't do it if it were a risk. It, you know, we are impervious to that as saved believers. And so to me, it's just intuitively like understood, you know, <laughs> because even as an unbeliever, um, despite what they like to depict in, you know, movies like The Exorcist, where the priest it gets possessed by casting the demon out, which seemed to me just even as a little kid who was like, you know, very anti-God, there was something very perverse about that. And I knew better, even as a little kid, I knew there was something wrong with that idea. I didn't know exactly why, but I knew that like if God were real and Jesus were true, you're, you know, I, somehow I knew that there was something wrong with the idea that a man of God 
not that a priest is a man of God, but, you know, let's, you know, purportedly a man of God would uh, be possessed by a demon, um, especially in the, in the process of casting them out of other people. Right. So um, that was something I never really, I just took for granted. I just uh, knew in my heart, but um, uh, I, you know, I, I had found a lot of people that believe the true gospel kind of just take it for granted. They don't kind of, you know, really go out of their way to look into it too much because it's just an absurd idea on its face. And so when um, somebody confronts them with this claim, which the most sophisticated form of it that I've come across so far, because I, I have a video on my channel where I uh, rebuke Derek Prince, the late Derek Prince, because not only did he teach that believers could be possessed by demons, but that uh, one demon he cast out of a believer was the demon of eternal security. And I don't know if you guys want to go ahead and play that clip. So, you know, just to start it off so people even know what we're talking about. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll go and play it now. I will take a moment or two to tell you of an experience that I had in the International Convention of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship some years back. And this was witnessed by about ten persons, two international directors of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship and other persons whose names I could give you and addresses and so on. It was not done in a corner. For me at that time, it was a unique experience. We dealt with a woman of English background, who is now a friend of ours, I know her personally, who came brought by a pastor for deliverance. I won't go into the details of how it started, but... We spent, my wife and I, five hours praying with this girl and a lady who sat by, and I didn't ask her to do this, counted and wrote down the names of 72 spirits that identified themselves and came out of her. Now, I'm sure there are many people with lots more than 72 spirits. After all, in the Bible, there was a man with a legion, which is 6,000. About one-third of the way through this, Every spirit spoke. I didn't ask them to, but they did. In fact, they started talking to me before I even knew what was happening. One of them said, I'm a seducing spirit. So I said, come out. And it said, I'm the seducer of the faith. So I said, still come out. And it said, I'm the chief one. And I said, still come out. And then it said, I have many roots. And I said, well, come out with all your roots in the name of Jesus. And then this girl or woman started to mention certain doctrines or put on certain acts. And after a few minutes, I realized that these were the roots of the seducing spirit that were coming out. And I grabbed a tablet with the Conrad Hilton name at the top and I wrote them down. And I actually wrote down 37 different deceiving spirits that came out of this one girl, all under the heading of the category of seducing spirits. Now, people have asked me what they were. I don't have the list with me, and I couldn't remember them all. Uh, and sometimes I feel I may offend people if I tell them, but I think this afternoon I'm going to tell you some of them. About the first one that came out was eternal security. About number two or number three was Jesus only. About number four, they didn't all give the name of a doctrine. Some just showed what they were. This one said, no pork, no bacon, no pork, no bacon, no pork, no bacon, no pork, no bacon. Hmm. Need a shower after that? <laughs> after hearing that? <laughs> I, love, I love this I change. <laughs> she just say, see, I'm the same way. Victoria's the same way. I think, Ben, I don't want to speak for you. I think you're the same way. That There's something about us that just love authentic people, that people are just right where they're at and they speak they mi their mind. That's what Angel just did. <laughs> you need a shower <laughs> after that because it's an assault Ugh. on your mind, right? Literally, yeah. I said, when you get assaulted Why? by lies, you have to go wash your mind with the word of God to wash that crap out. So, so go ahead, Sister Angel, please continue. And imagine continue. the itching ears, right? Those who hate the true gospel and eternal security. Oh, see, look, a demon said it. A demon told him it's an eternal security is a demon. That proof, proof positive. Like, it's like so ridiculous. Oh, I'm sure the demon couldn't be lying. 
You know, oh yeah, that's, yeah. That's, I mean, what that, yes. that's what that's all intended to do. What you say, Ben? <laughs> well, see, it's a, yeah, it's literally uh, uh, heating the doctrine of demons. You know, you're listening yeah. to, the, you're elevating the word of a demon over the word of God. Right. Well, why would a demon lie? Right. <laughs> oh, really? The demons go lie in that moment? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Like, you know, if Derek's not lying, and I honestly, I feel like it, you know, why wouldn't the demons do that to people that are prancing around? not even saved, pretending to be deliverance ministers. Why wouldn't they mess with them like that? Just lead them hmm. down all types of, you know, false roads by just like, I mean, that's, that's what I would do. Yo, I you know what? Demons... Uh, huh? Sorry. Sorry. Um, no, go on. No, well, you go. Uh, go. No. Okay. Well, yeah, that's what I figured. I mean, um, the, <laughs> the, uh, there, I, you guys probably heard this too. There's another popular one I'd, I'd be aware of. It's uh, mm -hmm. his name's Roger Morneau. He's supposedly he's an older gentleman again. That seems like it's always the yeah. older gentlemen or young kids. Like it lends him a, a, a an air of credibility. Um, mm -hmm. And Roger Morneau, for example, he's uh, interviewed about how he was recruited by the Illuminati or or, or whatever. And he says that uh, the demon told him something about uh, to Indeed. that uh, about worshiping on the the. There, it, it was the 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 testimony was presented by the uh, Seventh Day Adventists. Yeah, and the demon it was apparently, very convenient. Yeah, and they told them the demon told them that um, something like God, God uh, hates it when people worship him on Sunday or something like that. That's the big deal, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like let him yeah. in on the yeah. fact that the big deal, the real big deal, is is, is Sunday worship. That's the like, and I think that probably happened. I think. Like why wouldn't like, <laughs> why, why demons are like honest or like they're just out there to scare you? No, they're there to, to just lie to you. They use fear because it's an effective tactic in different situations. But most of the time, I think and doubt and, and just lie. And yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that would be the perfect thing to do because he would believe it from then on. Well, the demon told me. The demon said, <laughs> and like, why would the demon lie about that? Like, so stupid. <laughs> but that, like, what? You know, what did Paul years. say? If we or an angel from heaven mm -hmm. preach any other doctrine unto you than the doctrine you first received, let them be a curse. So if he said even an angel from heaven, he didn't even say, he didn't say a fallen angel. He said an angel from heaven came with that. So how yeah. much more for a demon and a devil to speak up and say, oh, there's a demon, <laughs> there's a devil called eternal security. <laughs> for real? Now, Sister Victoria made this point, and I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, Ben, or Angel, but that's okay. We can still tap dance on this all night. And Sister Victoria, I wanted you to go ahead and chime in on this, where you said, you asked me a question just prior to the broadcast. Was it, well, Jesus only spoke about eternal security. And this is a point I made, and I've made in numerous videos that I've done. When I first started even talking on YouTube, refuting this false doctrine that you could lose your salvation. Because Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. So how long is eternal, and how long is never? Go look at your calendar. Pick the, Show me the fifth of never. It doesn't exist. Because there's never means never. Under no situation, no circumstance, nothing you could ever point to. Never means never. And again, this is not just a prophet. This is not just a good man. This is the very God from very God manifested in the flesh telling you it's eternal life and you'll never perish. And yet, when you say that to people, they'll go, but. I, I, this is what I'm telling y'all. I'm telling you, let's, please hear me on this. There are people who claim that they believe in God. But they do not believe. That Jesus is God. Because if they did, they would never say, but. Because what he says cannot be refuted. He is the living God. Now, that means we have to then go sit down and figure out what he meant based on the other scriptures and get it in alignment and get it correct. The moment, the moment they say the word. The moment they say the word but, they place themselves under the law. And and in fact, uh, the scripture proves this out. For example, this is a common formula you'll see all the time. Um, for example, one of the first verses that struck me when I was reading the Bible as a, as a babe 
Uh, in fact, I probably wasn't even saved at this point, but I definitely think God was leading me. But it's an exodus where God says, basically, the Lord, the Lord, having mercy, forgiving iniquity for generations upon generations. He basically, it, it's all grace. He says, the Lord, forgiving, merciful. And then, but he, that, so he gives you the grace, but right underneath that, he says, but uh, not, not, uh, set, not uh, letting the guilty go free, essentially. And then you see it's again in like the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. He says, every sin and every blasphemy, including the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, uh, will be given me forgiven men. But those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, which again, in the context, the Holy Spirit, the idea was that you try to show them, hey, you guys are all about outward appearances and, and the, the physical uh, earth earthly principles. And you're neglecting the things of the Spirit, which is love and mercy and grace. And... Uh, it, it, and to call grace, you know, uh, greasy grace is to really kind of, it, it, it really to blaspheme grace. Um, and, you know, just which again, blaspheme just basically means to speak ill of, essentially. Um, but again, you see that formula where he says, you know, every sin, every blasphemy will be forgiven men, but uh, he who blasphemes the Holy Spirit. And then again, you see it in Revelation at the very end where it says, you know, he who desires the, the, uh, the water of life come freely, um, you know, without cost or price but anyone who adds these words or takes away from these words so again you see grace over law uh mercy triumphs over law and so as soon as you hear that word but they, they place themselves under the law and uh you know god's not mocked um they can try to use wordsmith and use you know sophistry uh to try to explain it away but the moment they entered but they've entered the law and they've condemned themselves uh and unless they eventually come to the point where they don't have to put that button there anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually blasphemy when they say, but because Jesus is God, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. We have the living word testifying of the things of heaven. Jesus said, if you don't, if you don't believe me when I'm showing you earthly things, how are you going to believe me and understand when I, when I start speaking about heavenly things? Now here we have him saying, eternal, everlasting, never-ending life. An uh, old Baptist preacher I love once said, he said, a believer in Jesus Christ could swing out over hell with a rusty corn stalk and his feet will never touch the flames of hell. That is God's guarantee. That is his stomp down righteous promise. Listen to me. I want y'all to listen to me very carefully. A lot of these people, if they do go to a true man or woman of God, that does cast a devil out of them, they were not saved. They were religious. Now, they can cast a devil out of their life, out of their homes, okay? When I say out of their life, I mean getting into their affairs, stirring up trouble, that kind of thing. Because we do know devils get demonic assignments. They get assignments to go do things. They get sent by witches and all that stuff. And I've said that people can get in agreement with the devil. If they're a born-again believer, they can do stuff they ain't got no business doing, like reading their horoscope every day or messing with a Ouija board or playing with tarot cards or going to some psalmist somewhere, uh, a palm reader, and getting that done. Christians do this crap, okay? Going and reading a witchcraft book and bringing that mess into their house. Uh, yeah, and y'all ain't going to like this one, don't care. That satanic music and go get that stuff and bringing it in your home. And... Demons can enter that way into the person's life, but into their physical body. The Bible says that our bodies are present tense, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not our own. We have been yep. bought with a price. We are his possession. Now, see, this is why I say, I'm sorry, Sister Angel. Go, no, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just. Are going. you just <laughs> saying, Amen? Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we are His purchased possession. So, if the Holy Spirit is in us, how in the world is the devil going to be in there too? And people are doing this weird stuff where they're going, "Well, no, not he can be in, in your mind. there, but like, like, like it's because it's not just it's not just in the presence of the Holy Spirit. They would have to overpower the Holy Spirit and capture what is His in order, which to is what the word possession control. means. Yes, yeah, that's that's but like, yeah, because they'll straw man this argument by saying the devil was in the presence of the Lord and Job. He was talking to him face to face. That's not that's not that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. We're talking about 
a de- now that, first of all, we're also talking about a demon, a lowly demon spoiling mm-hmm. the temple of the Lord and overtaking it and, and being able to uh, uh, use it at, as, 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 you know, at its, at its good pleasure. As, I mean, and this is what I wanted to talk about. I have this little, these, this like three verse walkthrough mm-hmm. that should help people tie this together about why this isn't uh, why this, cause you know, the Bible does, the Bible doesn't specifically like address this in, in just one place. It talks about why this isn't possible over and over again in many different ways. And we're supposed to draw, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. One thing you'll never see is any proof whatsoever that, that a believer can be possessed. But, it, you know, these verses that I have compiled, if a believer could be possessed, then basically the writers of the Bible and Jesus himself are just total, like, either crazy or they're sadistic. I mean, these were some of the things that they said. It would make no sense in the context of scripture. Um, it would be a lie. It would contradict the Bible. Um, and I think that, uh, like, I, I have yet pr- to see anybody point to a scripture that's pro- that proves this, 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 you know, lie from the pit of hell. Like, they don't, that's not what they say. They say this is a spiritual understanding. Like, this is, like, basically secret knowledge that has been kept from believers. And I've been told it's the devil's greatest weapon, is that we think we can't be possessed, basically. Like, like that, that's, that's, his, that's his big secret weapon, right? So, um but uh, yeah, so far, uh, they're very, very short on actual proof texts, whereas we, I'm sure we, we all have many <laughs> to bring to the table tonight, and they have no explanation for these ver- verses either um, that I've seen. Now, I did tell people that uh, follow me on my community tab to come tonight, and if they're in the chat or, or wherever, to leave, you know, like if they have a good argument, you know, to, 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 to put it in chat, and we'll address it, you know, on air. So if anybody's listening and you guys disagree with us, l- let us know in the chat. Uh, we will politely address what you're saying. I want to see and, and hear like all the different possible arguments that, you know, people could level, you know, at us about this subject. I, I, because I haven't seen a lot of argumentation. I've just seen a whole lot of people defending Derek Prince and saying what a great man he is. And how dare I, how dare I, how dare I, you know, uh, speak against him. He was a wonderful man. And you know, no matter how he's blaspheming the gospel or, or how preposterous, people are enamored of him. So I don't, you know, he, he's he's very, uh, he was very suave, you know. That's how he got so popular. He seemed very knowledgeable, like a wise old librarian. Well, mar- marvel not if for a, it, Satan himself can uh, mm. masquerade as an angel of light, you know. Yeah, yep. oh, yeah I mean... Okay, are we going to esteem men? Or are we going to esteem the word of God? I mean, this is what we go to in all matters of faith and practice as believers. This is what keeps us steady. We have a more sure word of prophecy. We have an anchor with the word of God that if we start to drift in an area, the word is what's going to keep us properly aligned with Christ. It's going to make sure that we have the mind of Christ. I don't want to have the mind of Derek Prince or any other preacher. I want to have the mind of Christ. So then in keeping with the doctrine of Christ, he said, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Right. His word says that and when he said, I give unto you power in our body. Yeah. He said, I give unto you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. That don't sound iffy and shaky and wobbly to me. So, Do you know, I'm personally of the opinion that if a believer, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, born again, blood washed, right? Born of the spirit, sealed by the spirit, makes a decision that I'm tired of this crap and I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and the devil whooping my behind and stands up. Wearing the whole armor of God and doing exactly what the scripture tells them to do. They cast the devil out themselves. And I'm not talking about out of their bodies. I'm talking about out of their life, out of their family and other things that's going on when he comes to stir stir up trouble and and do stuff. The the devil is always busy. We're supposed to be always looking out for that sly serpent and ready to cast him out at a moment's notice from anything where we find him. But a lot of time believers just roll over and play dead. And this is what I was talking to Ben about, how when people do not 
do what the word of God says for them to do and place their faith and trust in the Lord, they bring themselves under a curse. Because now you're, tur you're turning to other things that the Lord never intended nor desired for, to, for you to grab hold of. When we're supposed to be grabbing hold of him and trusting in him. And like so they get burning sage to get rid of evil spirits. Yeah, just, like yes, crap like that. Oh, God. Such an okay. insult. Okay. Just it imagine. Is. It is. You got a Holy Spirit, you got the, the authority of Jesus Christ, and you're sitting there messing around with, you know, sage and, you know, salt on your door and stuff like that. But, you know, it's good because it's fun. Everybody wants to be able to feel like they can tinker. They've got all this, like, oh, I've got the tools in my demon arsenal, you know? And it's like too boring for people, I think. But I think a lot of people just get so. It's, it's almost like alluring. So it's almost boring to make it as simple as you're a believer, you're saved and still you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, you have the, the guarantee and the protection of the Holy Spirit in your body because, by the way, that's another point. They claim, they, and I guess this is how Derek Prince would argue this. I, I, from what I understand, this is what he said. He said that um, uh, the believer's body can be possessed. You know, and people even who believe in eternal security who hold to this say that the spirit is sealed and saved, but the body is condemned and can be possessed. Now, that's all I know of ever being possessed. I've seen no distinction there. I think that's what demons possess, right. believers or, or, or not, right? But um, our body belongs to God. Our body is, is not like, it's not, this is like a Gnostic idea to separate our body so much away from the rest of us as if it's not one in the same our body is going to be glorified god doesn't just let the bones rot in the ground he's going to raise them up out of the ground you know uh to that to, to to reconstitute people's uh actual bodies who've been long dead this yourself is is saying is it's like a, a sacred thing to god the the, the notion of self he, it's not divisible just as the body of christ is not divisible he's not going to divide you or you know you in terms of like your your permanent identity, it's not like our bodies are just going to be thrown on the uh, you know the the wood pile. We're it, it, they're going to be glorified. He's going to, to fix them, but they are who we are. They're part of us. That's like part of our triune nature, basically. So people, but they act like the the, the demons can possess the the believer's body, and this is a you know we know that the body is very literally the temple of the Lord for a believer, and so. That's actually what I wanted to state real quickly before before we go much further, because I think a lot of us are probably going to go back to these verses. And I really want to, to just say them in order so people like to, to where I can try to walk people through um, why these verses, you know, uh, all together have to mean what we're saying that they mean. Because, you know, if people aren't very good with literary analysis and like reading comprehension, it might they might not understand how they relate or but it's like, I'm going to try to like build this case really quickly um, uh, to show them three things the Bible states that, uh, you know, unless they can get, point out, you know, how, how this, you know, doesn't mean what I think it means. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's ridiculous to conclude that uh, the Bible even would allow for demonic possession of believers. Um, so the first uh, verse we're going to start with is. Uh, Matthew 12, 43 through 45. And um, in this verse, uh, well, I'll just read real quick. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be under this wicked generation. Now, uh, so, you know, obviously the house is a, is a metaphor for the, you know, the body. We're talking about uh, the demonic or, you know, demonic possession in this verse. And uh, Jesus is warning about sweeping the house of, un of, of the unclean spirit. Um and basically making it even more inviting uh, for even more and worse spirits to return, right? Now, if there's no way to prevent this, why would Jesus even be telling us this? Why would he even 
warn us about this as, as though the implication is, is that there's a, there's a better way. We don't want to sweep the house up, clean it up, garnish it, uh, 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 basically make it even more appealing and, uh, and leave it empty and unoccupied and vacant for even more spirits to return because you'd be even worse off than you were before you cast out the first spirit. So if there's not a solution and there's not a way to prevent spirits from being able to possess your body, why would he be telling us this? Because it would actually mean that you better not even cast out the first spirit that, you know, that's possessed you because really uh, if you do that, seven more will come back because once you cast out the spirit that's possessed you, you know, then, you know, some, you know, your, your body, your house will be even more inviting for more and worse spirits. So really, if there's no solution and there is no way to prevent possession, then we shouldn't be doing deliverance whatsoever because we're actually risking people being in an even worse state than they were to begin with because even more spirits will, will enter, you know, and, 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 you know, the verse clearly says worse spirits than the, you know, than the first one um, and that you're, you're going to be worse off. Right. So I, I hope people understand that, like the implication here. Uh, if even being a saved and sealed believer doesn't protect you from demonic possession, then this verse is just basically him, you know, kind of rubbing it in, just rubbing in like how crappy it's going to be until, <laughs> you know, until we, uh, you know, until we are glorified, I guess, um, you know, until we leave this mortal coil, because we're always going to have to worry about uh, being possessed. And also, we're going to have to worry that if we if we get delivered, that we're actually going to be in for an even worse fate when uh, yet more spirits, even worse than the, than the former spirit uh, happens upon us and sees us, you know, open for business. Right. So that's horrible. That would be terrible. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like good news to me. So we're going to go really quickly to um, Mark three twenty seven. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man. And then he will spoil his house. Verily I see unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemy is wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now, why is he talking about that following this, uh, this uh, you know, metaphor, I guess you would say, or analogy with the strong man and uh, spoiling his house? Because that was, you know, they the, the, the strong man of his house and a believer's house is the Holy Spirit, right? That's what, that's what he was referring to. And no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first uh, will bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Basically, if you're trying to ransack or, or rob a, a, a someone's house and there's a, you know, a, like my dad with all of his guns and his like, you know, six foot two frame in there, you're going to have a tough time. You're going to have to, you're going to have to subdue him first. Whereas, you know, if it were an empty house or even just, you know, some like just little old me in here, it wouldn't be too hard. It would be really, you know, relatively easy to subdue me. This is something I think we all understand. Um, so this is an important verse because actually this verse was pointed out to me when I first got saved in the midst of dealing with the spiritual warfare in my house with my best friend who, you know, she was a victim of, of bloodline, you know, ritual abuse and mind control. And um, I had consulted a guy named Marion Knox. Now, I am not uh, endorsing him. Uh, I have uh, a whole lot of questions about his understanding of the gospel subsequent to all of this. Um, but he did uh, actually like give me a very clear and accurate gospel presentation when I when I um, contacted him for help with my friend. At, at, you know, and he really laid it out for me and answered a lot of questions. Uh, right after this whole incident with the demon fleeing the name of Jesus. So it was like a really crucial time for me. And I do appreciate that he did that. And he had a lot of uh, wisdom when it came to how this, these spirits operate. And, um, you know, and he had some, he, a bit, bit, what he did was he, he at least claimed to have delivered something like 500 victims, similar to my friend, from uh, the bondage of, of you know, uh, ritual abuse and my control and possession. And um, he, you know, he made it very clear to me that the only solution to what we often refer to as uh, uh, programming, my control programming, Luciferian ritual abuse, all that is 
sell, you know, the person believing on the Lord Jesus and, and uh, being involved with the Holy Spirit. And that will free them of, of all of the ritual uh, the demonization that's been done to them over their lifetime. It's really that simple. And that's the only thing that will work. That, you know, and that's, that's what he explained to me. Now, he was using this verse, talking about the strong man. And he also said that, you know, a lot of these uh, families, these uh, cults, they have a kind of a, a satanic inverse of this verse. Like they, they kind of uh, uh, mimic it. Um, and I forget exactly how he, all, he applied it, but he said this was a very important verse in terms of spiritual warfare that, you know, was very rarely discussed. And, and so he explained to me about the Holy Spirit being the strong man of a believer's house. And that that's the, that's, that's the reason that the only solution to ritual abuse and generational cursing and, and this demonization that's done to these people that are born into these families is salvation, is the Holy Spirit. Because then the Holy Spirit becomes the strong man. And, that's, and no matter if they try to get their paws on them again or not, it's, it's not going to work. And so right off the bat, dealing with, you know, a guy who, you know, from what I understand, I mean, he's had articles written about him. He's very well known in the circles as somebody who for free, basic, you know, spends all of his time talking to people like my friend and uh, uh, trying to help them out of uh, this horrible reality that a lot of these uh, people find themselves in when they're born into these families. And so... Um, I, and I don't hear a lot of people talking about that verse, but that's an important concept because if we understand that a house symbolizes, uh, the body and you know, that that's, uh, that, that these are two things used interchangeably. And we understand that the body is of the believer is literally the Lord's temple, which I'll, uh, let me just flip here to Corinthians. I think we all know this, but just to be thorough. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. Now, that's just one of many verses uh, discussing, like, the very literal reality that our bodies belong to God and to the Lord Jesus once we're saved. The idea that because our flesh is fallen, that that means somehow our bodies are... I mean, that Satan can enter them, essentially. If a demon can, why can't Satan enter our bodies as believers? It makes no difference. Like, there, there's no uh, distinction between uh, a, 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 a believer and a lost person uh, if the believer can have their bodies possessed, as Derek Prince states, uh, because that's the only thing that a, a lost person has possessed either, is if they get demonically possessed, it's their body. Uh, we, we don't have any reason to think that any other part of them gets possessed. It's just, it's their body. And um, so we're just no better off, according to Derek Prince, than an unsaved person who does not have the Holy Spirit, because somehow demons can overtake the Holy Spirit and, you know, spoil his temple. They can actually uh, uh, take, you know, capture his, what do you call it, um, kind of like capture the flag, basically. I mean, they can, they can, uh, uh, I don't know if, they, if the idea is when he's not looking or, you know, normally these people say that it has something to do with our level of sin at the time. Basically that our sin um, uh, and, you know, basically where we're at in our walk can determine our vulnerability to these, these unclean spirits, um, which totally like misses the point that take us out of the equation for a second. This is between the Holy Spirit, you know, the Lord God himself and these lowly demons, which I mean, these people say demons are very powerful. You guys don't understand. You don't understand how powerful demons are. I had somebody say that to me and I'm not trying to, if you're listening, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but do you hear yourself? You don't understand how powerful demons are. I don't think you understand how powerful God is. I don't think you understand how powerful the name and authority of Jesus Christ is. I don't think you understand how powerful the Holy Spirit is. Uh, you know, I don't think that it's, it's, uh, we're not called to exalt and, uh, you know, and, you know, wonder at the, the power and the, and the might of demons. We're to be respectful. We're not supposed to, uh, you know, uh, run our mouths basically uh, as if, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're tough and we don't really understand all that they're capable of. 
we don't understand uh, the things that they know. We know that they're, you know, they're a lot older and a lot wiser than us. So we're not supposed to get um, uppity, you know, when it comes to spiritual wickedness, but right. uh, we're not supposed to put Doesn't them on our power. Yeah, and compare their abilities to those, that, like to, to the Lord, to the Holy Spirit. I, I mean, the idea, if they can take his temple, that means they are on par with him in terms of power and authority. I don't understand, like that doesn't, uh, like you, you couldn't imagine some little podunk country right now trying to come take over the U.S. by force, right? Like, let's think of a, a real podunk out of the way country. You guys, can you name one? Um, um, I don't know, <laughs> Mongolia. Let's say Mongolia. Or do we, we're, we're not worried about that. We're not actually worried about Mongolia invading us and taking us over. Why? Because the notion's preposterous. Because we have a much more powerful military than they do. Mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, that's just the fact. Not not the same thing bad about Mongolia. Mongolia is pretty mm -hmm. awesome, actually, but it's a ridiculous notion. But when you're saying that a demon can do this to the Lord's temple, you're 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 saying that they are they are somehow uh, on the same level of power and might as the Lord, or that what he's going to be caught unaware because mm -hmm. what because of how much sin we're committing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you know that that's the, that's the thing the sin is is not the issue anymore and that's why it shocked me to find out people that actually believe the correct gospel are buying into this it was one thing to find out to know that people who don't really believe the gospel that they, they haven't seized from their works in terms of salvation they don't really trust jesus they're just still trusting themselves they still mm -hmm. think that they have to attain or maintain salvation via their filthy rags that you know they they have an entirely like, you know, uh, like overblown uh, uh, perspective of in terms of like, like, you know, what they what they think their efforts mean to God, um, that they can somehow impress him. Um, I don't I don't expect them to understand why believers can't be possessed. They think you can fall in and out of salvation. They think that God is so sloppy and flaky that he would write the whole Bible, you know, inspire the whole Bible. And be so exacting and so mm -hmm. exhaustively detailed in mm -hmm. all these ins and outs of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, which were largely irrelevant for the majority of history in terms of like the gospel ground of the Gentiles. Doesn't, none of that, that stuff really matters to us unless it's a symbol of something else, right? So he's going to be right. that exhaustive and detailed in how, and, 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 and you know, people, you know, it's kind of the Old Testament is kind of famous in some places for just like what an autist God is about all of the little tiny ritual details and the, and the, and the legal details of how everything works. Because you know why? Because God is so fair. He needed mm -hmm. to make sure nobody could claim that he did not provide them with adequate information in order for them to do what he was asking of them at the time. Right. Because uh, mm -hmm. it was, it was too important. So he was abundantly clear. And he repeated himself over and over again. So there could be no confusion. And yet that same God would fail in the new covenant to give us the exact formula, the exact equation, the exact ratio of good works to bad works. One must maintain uh, at all times of repenting to not repenting of, of, of um, you know, thinking to do good. Um, and failing to do so versus actually acting on the good you thought to do. All of these things that need to be somewhere. I mean, you know, only God could know, according to these people. They think he would leave that up in the air. If we look at the Bible that we know today uh, and, the, and the new covenant we understand today, we would none of us would have any way of knowing at any point whatsoever where we stood with God if we could fall in and out of salvation based on our walk because he provided no such information. He did not give us any way to figure that out. We would be in constant fear. And, we, and, and, and honestly, we would, people could charge God all day long at the judgment seat with not providing adequate information, you know, with which to perform <laughs> the desired task. That's basically, it would be like having laws and, and, and uh, charging people for breaking the laws, but you never told them what the laws were. You never even codified them, never wrote them down for even anybody to consult. Uh, that's, that's what it would be like if God failed to tell us exactly how we could know at any given point exactly where we stood by adding up all of our good to bad works, you know, of late 
and all of, you know, that it, it would be impossible. It's not possible to provide that kind of information. Uh, <laughs> but let's say it was. That's what would be required if we could lose salvation. The reason that he didn't do that and the reason he said what he said is because it's actually very, it's just as simple as believe, believe the record of his son, believe that Christ, Christ was the one who did all of that, all of that, all of those mathematics, all of those equations. He was sufficient. And the answer was, guess what? Perfect. hundred percent. No sin. <laughs> no, no, you know, no ratio of good to bad works. No bad works. All good works. All perfect. That would be the answer. That's what's required for eternal life. Um, so that's why there was no equation provided to know where you stood with God based on your walk so far. Um, it, because it was just as simple as what he did say. And people who think they can lose their salvation, but they also claim they believe in the grace of God, they don't understand. There's no, you can't have it both ways. If you can lose your salvation based on your works, then you're working for salvation. It's just maintenance works. It's, it's so, it's like, this is the why he warned against double-mindedness. These two things are are completely contradictory uh loss of salvation and the, uh, the gospel of grace not it, it it actually is as simple as it sounds that we are to believe when asked what must i do to be saved what was the response do you not think that like the, the like well the bible you know i'm sure more was said than just that but this is what was recorded no that's not how it works because god has god has to, is so fair he has mm -hmm. to know, like, nobody can accuse him of leaving out, like, need to know information, <laughs> right? That's right? This is the, <laughs> so, so it was belief on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And what is that belief? It's not just believe he existed, believe he was the son of God. You believe what he did for you. And if you believe what he did for you, you know, you can't lose your salvation. Because it has nothing to do with what you do. It's, uh, it, it, it's you're, you're sealed under the day of redemption. Uh, uh, you know, seated in heavenly places and made a new creature upon believing. It, it, and God made it that way because if there was anything we had to do besides that one moment of belief and faith, none of us would be saved because we would always screw it up. So it is that simple. But people who don't even understand that, I don't expect them to know why believers can't be possessed. But the ones who do understand that, and who stand on the grace of God and the blessed assurance that he's provided us, that we know where we're going when we die, which is why it's good news, which is why we can be joyous, which is why we're not to fear. I mean, why wouldn't he, why wouldn't he expect us to fear if we could possibly lose our salvation? I mean, that's the most terror. It, it's actually bad news. The gospel is bad news if you can lose your salvation, because maybe before you didn't even know there was a hell. Maybe before you didn't even, you just thought, you just, you know, blinked out of existence when you died. And now you're told, oh, now there's this heaven and this hell. And Jesus did this. And so be on your best behavior and believe that, you know, he is what he said he was uh, and be on your best behavior. And if you're lucky, you'll make the cut. Like that's terrifying. That's worse than just not having any, any belief in God. That's, that's so much worse, but especially because there was nothing provided in the Bible to where we could know where we stood like that's i don't under <laughs> that's so terrifying <laughs> that's worse than that's worse than the infinite void of nothingness when we die it is much worse uh, so uh the point is if if even people who are uh, who are uh who know enough who understand god enough to know that the, the you know when saved always saved is actually the gospel can fall for this um I think we need to go into why. What's the what's the allure? What's the temptation? Why are people there's it, they have itching ears, really, like because a lot of times when you try to confront them or or rebuke them or explain why this isn't why they're why they're wrong, it's almost as if you're raining on their parade. I've noticed at least it's almost like they want to believe this. Well, and so well, I'd like to know like what a, you guys think about that. What well, girl? You said a whole lot. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> No, I didn't want to interrupt you, though, because you were definitely on a roll, and I was getting fired up by it. As a lot of stuff I could have said amen to, um, but I didn't even want to interrupt you. But I I want you to be able to catch your breath, yeah. get a sip of water for a second, okay? Cause, hold on it's to your so, thought about what you It's exhausting to state the obvious. Well, you know? it is, because there's <laughs> so much that we could state, okay? But yeah, I wanted to but, bring this to the panel, because we got somebody arguing for demon possession. They're for it. Yeah, for the I'm believer. Glad okay. I'm glad they so, came. That's cool. I, I respect that. It was, so, I'm excited so, to hear. We got a champion for demon possession for believers. Uh, one with Christ. 
<laughs> believes that a believer like can a be demon-possessed. And he cited a scripture. It's fair. Let's let's bring it up. Rich, bring it that's up. good. Ben, awesome. ben, um, it is in Matthew 16, 22 through 23. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke. He's rebuking Jesus, saying, be it far from you, Lord. This shall not be uh, unto you, but he turned and said unto Peter, get me behind, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense unto me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but those uh, of men. I'm sorry, I just pulled that up from the internet real quick. So that's not the KJV. Ben, if you want to go ahead and maybe yeah, read like that in the KJV. Already. There's so much. And then I like, I know there's so much to be said about that scripture because they're saying, because he said uh, that, that Satan entered. Peter. So, Ben, do you have anything you'd like to say about that? Well, the word Satan in general just means adversary. So he was just playing an adversarial role. Uh, but if you want to say that he actually was, uh, you know, Satan, it just it's just that he was under the influence of Satan. He was seeing things from the from the worldly perspective. Uh, that does not prove that at all. In fact, the Bible goes out of its way to say Satan entered Judas, which we know was an unbeliever. Yeah. And it doesn't say that of Peter. He just says that Peter had the mindset of the world, wasn't thinking on the things of God and how, the way he uh, does things and and what what his plan was. He was thinking of his own uh, desires, essentially, not to uh, see Christ crucified. And so that that that, that doesn't really like anti gospel also because he totally doesn't realize the point right. of any of it exactly right so i mean exactly. <laughs> like who knows i mean i i know it's a debatable about when which person was saved but in that very moment at least he's expressing the what he, the, the sentiments that are not consistent with someone who understands what jesus is going to do right so but either way the bible does this all the time it uses these comparisons you know you are that elias was he literally elias you know they're, they're like like it's a uh it's a figure of speech uh, when, you know, I think the Bible would have done more to record this, this moment where, you know, Matthew was literally possessed by the devil. Um, he was speaking in the spirit of the devil at the time. It was the Antichrist, you know, uh, mentality, uh, what, but he didn't know it. It was his love of Jesus that caused him to do that. But it's still, Jesus is not just being for his benefit. He knows these words are going to be recorded and read by all of humanity for the rest of, you know, the rest of our time here until his return. So, he is, you know, doing two things at once, and he's he's explaining that this is the spirit of, of you know of Satan, who would seek to prevent me from doing what I must do because what I must do will save, you know, the, the whole world, especially those who believe. Right. He even says in that verse, he says, "But he turned to turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan! You are an offense yeah. to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men." So yeah. again, it's it's about having the his mindset was not right. So he calls him Satan in that respect. He's an adversary to mm -hmm. the things of yeah. God. Yeah. Well, this is what I asked one with Christ. I said, "Well, you're arguing this position. What is your explanation as to why Jesus didn't cast the devil out of him?" Yeah. So I'm I'm Ever. still waiting for the answer. I mean, in fairness. You put the I scripture up. I asked you to give me one example as to what you thought was demon possession in the new covenant in a born again believer. And that's the scripture you pointed to. So, OK, then you should have an explanation as to why Jesus didn't cast the devil out if he was possessed. Amen. Good call. Nobody did even subsequent to that. I guess everybody just let him keep being possessed for the rest of his life. Right. So I think most of us understand that when we see that. A person, a believer, can be used mightily of the devil. They can even be in agreement with Satan and speak things that are against the scripture. That doesn't mean they're demon-possessed. Yep. And I okay, know Derek so, Prince okay, used so. the word demonized, but he claims that the man in the tombs was demonized. So it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Like the word demonized in the context he uses it is just possessed. I mean, he says it's a bad translation. It shouldn't have been called possessed. The point is he makes no distinction between what happens to a believer and an unbeliever when a demon enters them. So, it, it, but we all agree that we can be unknowingly influenced. By right. It, 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 you know, how ridiculous is it to say, you know, that the, the demons flee, flee, as you could attest, mm -hmm. Angel, and the Bible attests as well, that demons flee at the mere mention of Jesus, but some right. uh, of his spoken word, but somehow they could coexist in the believer. So Christ is in the believer and the demons in the believer at the same time, <laughs> but the mere word of Jesus uh, casts them away. It, it's it's preposterous. 
I don't okay, well, an let, let me just state for the record because I brought the person's name up because they challenged they they said that you could be demon possessed and we said I said well then please in the chat provide one scripture I didn't attack anybody I said please just provide one scripture that says it this is the scripture they brought up we're dissecting it according to the scripture and what the scripture says because you have to examine all scripture in the light of other scripture to get the proper understanding so that you don't end up in error that's rightly dividing the word of truth. And then when we started to extrapolate on it, here's here's one with Christ's response. All right. I'm just reading it. Whatever. I'm out. I don't care. What, well, you just spent the last like 15 we minutes did in that the chat. You cited your scripture. Oh, whatever. I'm out. We're done. This is over. Like, <laughs> what would you think? Oh, they don't have a response. They don't have an argument. Now they're running because I proved which is why I directly it. spoke to it, because <laughs> yeah. we, look, we didn't arrive at this willy nilly. Like we had a dog in this fight, like, oh, I just believe this. I have no reason to believe it. I just believe this. Therefore, I'm just going to stand for it. No, we went and examined and the scriptures. I won't and hear we... anybody challenge me on it <laughs> Well, we know that you guys are going to bring up these arguments because this is an old heresy that has been in the church for a while now. And again, I want to reiterate, we do not believe that a person can't be attacked by spirits. Um, vexed by spirits, getting into yeah. demonic agreement and do things that are ungodly. We're not saying any of that. We're saying even. a believer cannot be possessed by the devil, where the devil takes them over and they have no control over what they're doing. Okay. That's a bunch of bunk. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, uh, people Sister underestimate Victoria. how severe possession is. It's not just like, oh, I'm smoking too yeah. much. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I, I can't stop cursing and stuff like that. OK. Oh, and then I wanted to we're going to come back after the break and talk about another aspect of this as to why we see these types of behaviors in believers when they're not demon possession. OK, uh, Sister Victoria, you've been uh, a silent for a while. I've been seeing you earnestly contending for the faith in the chat, though. So I, I'd like you to um, if you would on this passage of scripture, we just pointed to there about Peter. I mean, that has always, uh, from from what I've understood from believers who have had this position and even other scholars, they have, I've never heard anybody say <laughs> with any credibility, I don't know, maybe you guys can point to somebody, some big scholar that says, well, that proves demon possession, the scripture that was just cited there in Matthew. But uh, it, it hasn't it always been that people understood that Peter is saying something that is against the mind of Christ, which is why we're always talking about make sure you're in agreement with Christ. How do we do that? Get into the scriptures and see what they say and glean from the scriptures. What is the appropriate, quote unquote, mind of Christ? Because there are people who preach against eternal security. We know that's not the mind of Christ because the only life he ever offered was eternal life. So uh, go ahead, Sister uh, Victoria. You wanted me to talk about the about Peter. You can talk about whatever you want, oh, but uh, this is what we were just talking about was in that scripture. He, no, I don't think he was possessed at all. I I I think that he um I think that he like you guys kind of already went over it. I think that he his mom he was just uh cuz I do believe Satan can, you know, mess with our minds sometimes, not that he can read our minds, but he can influence us. Right. And I'll, that's all I was. I think it's kind of simple. That's all I was that I think was happening with Peter and things were going on that he just oh, did. Yeah. A and Peter, yeah, I've seen demons and, influence people without possessing them. Right. And before my eyes. That's all I mm -hmm. think. I don't see. I don't think it's that complicated myself. I think. He was just well, I don't it. either, because even when you look at what the word the, the Lord's rebuke. He explains exactly why he's rebuking him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't cast the devil out of him mm -hmm. if he was possessed. He says, says, then Peter took him. This is in the That's KJV. And began to rebuke yeah. him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So he's rebuking the words that are coming out of Peter's mouth. But like I said, Jesus has been running around casting the devil out of people. Exactly. So why would he leave the devil in Peter if Peter had the devil in him? 
and right exactly. before that, and right before so that, one of you is a devil. Well, not it, two it, of you are a devil. Exactly. Sure. Good call. Sure. Good call, <laughs> Angel. And also yes. to, in, in Matthew sixteen, the, a few verses back it up a little bit, back up the truck to verse thirteen. Uh, he talks about G, uh, uh, Peter claiming that he's cl first person who claims you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. So are we going right. to say that, that that's the uh, demon demonic words too? When should we st stop trusting Peter <laughs> if he's right. demon possessed? And again, I, I I personally believe when he says get behind me, Satan. I don't think he's using Satan. It just means adversary. It's a generic term mm -hmm. in Hebrew. In mm -hmm. Greek it means adversary. So I don't think he's really actually saying you are actually Satan. Uh, he's just saying that you are you are basically uh, espousing his views. <laughs> but you, you know, right? That's all. Yeah, I agree with you on that. He's rebuking the words that are coming out of Peter's mouth because they're not in agreement with. The scripture, we know the Bible says for this cause, he came into the world. So uh, but as you pointed out, because just before that, Jesus is extolling that the Lord has revealed something to Peter. that was not it was revealed by the spirit, the, the father, excuse me, the father, and that it, it wasn't his own understanding that he'd even revealed that to him. And then he's coming back and literally like the very next breath. And rebuking something that's coming out of his mouth, which shows you that even believers can be in error. And when they're when we're in error, the word, which is Jesus, will correct us. But you know, I, okay. So should we do what the person uh, did and just go, oh, whatever, I'm out. I don't know. Wait, so, we actually we actually explained ourselves and you know rebutted what they said which is all we were expecting. I mean, we didn't even ask them. Okay, so let's just say we give you that. He was Satan. He was possessed by Satan. Whatever. Let's say, what about the verses we've already stated? How do we explain that? Like the verses mm -hmm. we were already pointing out about how the Bible is, you know, clearly mm -hmm. uh, just not inerrant if, if if you can be possessed like by, by demons. Like it's not the literary masterpiece everybody says because, they, you know, it, it'd be all over the place for, you know, some of these principles to be in there. Uh, but totally contradicted by the demonic possession of the believer. So we stated some of these verses. I have mm -hmm. yet to have any of the Derek Prince's acolytes address them, except to wave of the hand. Oh, that's a spiritual verse. That's spiritual. Yeah. That's not. That's. I love that. I love whenever a verse appears to prove you wrong, it's just spiritual. But then no, like okay, all right. So that's spiritual. Can you show me other examples? Like instead of just like this one, this one off where. That particular verse is spiritual, even though the same sentiments are repeated, you know, multiple times, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a, always a convenient out. That's that's, you know, we we say things are spiritual and not literal, uh, which is not what mm -hmm. we're doing when it comes to the you know the idea of, of get thee behind me, Satan. Um, it, we didn't just you know dismiss it. That's that's spiritual because it would still be <laughs> spiritual if you mm -hmm. know Satan possessed him. That's a spiritual issue. What we're saying is that. This is like most, I, ever since I ever saw that verse, I never once, even as an unbeliever, thought that meant that he was possessed by Satan. It, <laughs> I know that the re, the standards of like, you know, uh, reading comprehension have drastically diminished over like the diminished. past 15 years. So True. I don't even, I honestly think it's too much to ask uh, nowadays for a young person to actually understand That's why that sad. verse isn't saying that. It, see, it does actually seem like a tall order, but it, like nobody takes it that way. And Ben also pointed out that the word Satan, I, we could even go to the Greek and see, see that, you know, see the original translation, but it is, you know, clearly the best, the best evidence that that's not what it meant was that at mm -hmm. no point was it ever dealt with that one of these apostles was being possessed by Satan. And, you know, he never meant, Jesus never mentioned that there was more than one of the apostles who was the devil. Like there's just tons of inconsistencies with that theory. And that's all we're asking for people who are on the opposing side to do is flesh mm -hmm. out the argument. Don't just jump from thing to thing and say, you know, and like, every, like move goalposts basically. So where we, we prove one thing wrong and then you either walk away or you just jump to the next thing without actually explaining what our argument means for your argument. Like, right. so we just said these things now uh contextualize that for us what do, what do you have to say about that how does that fit in where are we wrong that's how a debate works 
you don't just like jump from lily pad to lily pad like you right. know trying yeah, to find somewhere to, to get clear. us because there's a trail of things that you haven't accounted for you know? <laughs> exactly exactly it, yeah it has to be coherent every biblical doctrine has to be coherent has to harmonize and so that's right yes, there are a lot of verses that seemingly contradict each other but then when you uh compare uh, all the put you know line up all the lily pads if you will you see that it makes a nice path if you connect all the dots and uh that's that's how you come to sound doctrine uh you don't take one ver pet verse and say oh yep see peter was possessed i mean <laughs> so now, that see, means all this, this is... other stuff the bible said contradicts but that's okay like we have way bigger problems <laughs> if that's the case we have way well, yeah problems if we could really be demon possessed, possessed yeah. we got some bigger problems than yeah that. because god's word <laughs> is totally like you know uh excuse my language that shit and it means you know it just contradicts all over the place <laughs> And God just like flits from one thing to the next, like 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 I don't know, like Muhammad, maybe. Like you know, that's what that reminds me of. That reminds me a lot of the Quran, where they had right. to come up with a doctrine saying a lot doesn't have to be consistent. <laughs> Who are you to expect a lot to be consistent? That's what they had oh, to no. do because their their book was, was so it's fallible. A but a Bible, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Basically, <laughs> like it doesn't, you know, you who are you to question it? Okay, wait. I just that of us. That's not how God wiggles out of things with us. He says, let's reason together. You know, he doesn't just say, who are you to question me? Yeah, uh, you know, exactly. it's none of your business what I told him then. I'm telling you this now. <laughs> like, See, that's, that's, their, that's what they believe, though. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience, this is exactly why I have Sister Angel uh, here. Because she comes from a perspective that literally shatters. This woman, okay, for those of you who don't know her testimony, most of you do because you follow her or the or the my my channel, and you heard her testimony. She went from atheism to faith in Christ. You are not going to be able to pull the wool over this woman's eyes. <laughs> she is I was like obnoxious, like as exactly. obnoxious as I am now, in, in 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 defense of the gospel. I was that obnoxious about my my uh god hating well you know uh, but less well well argued i will say that because i hadn't read the bible so um you know like most atheists but uh but right, i mean right. a lot of times like people who are former atheists and they are very opinionated like they have to know why they believe what they believe you know they're, they're like a lot of people approach christians like they were just told from a young age to believe this and they didn't question mm -hmm. it so a lot of times christians who are right will look wrong because they do have childlike faith and that's okay. It's okay for, you know, we, we should have an answer for everyone, but it is okay to trust God that much that you don't, you know, have to understand all of his reasoning. But the point is, is God doesn't just say, because I said so, you right. know, I mean, he could, but he, instead he gives us, he gives us a way to follow his reasoning and to, and to, you know, always, um, if we have something we don't understand, we don't agree with him about like, he will, uh, you know, kind of lower himself to our level a little bit and reason with us to where, you know, he doesn't have to, he's, he's, he's God, he's almighty, but he, he didn't, um, he wouldn't consider that an honorable quality in a person to not be able to defend their position or be consistent. So he's going to be consistent and defend, you know, and, 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 and build the foundation that we can, I mean, the Bible is amazing because, you know, I've been knows better than anybody, maybe, you know, how, uh, methodical god was mm -hmm. in giving you ways to find the truth of his word like in in the most <laughs> like minute detail uh ben right. is i mean has pointed things mm -hmm. out i i have never heard anybody point out about different literally patterns literally. and techniques blind man yeah, blind man. yeah. no i'm not even yeah. trying to be funny i knew a, a person that was a believer that was completely blind since birth so how does <laughs> how does that happen right okay that because they listened to these various arguments and they listened to the scripture and they came to faith in Christ. Interesting how that could happen. Now we're gonna we're gonna go to break here in, in just a moment. So when everybody catch a breath, go refresh your favorite beverage, and come on back and listen to Angel continue <laughs> to destroy this oh, no. concept. I, I, it's your turn, <laughs> you guys. I uh I thought you had I, uh, one more point to make. No, I was I had the three verses where I was trying to trying to kind of line upon line. Like if this verse says this and this verse says this, then like you 
what, you know, the basically that they told, how do you explain these verses and what they're clearly saying in light of what you're proposing? Because yeah, I, I, I find point. That, that that's, yeah, uh, it's been a, pressed. No, I, 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 well, no, I, I don't, I don't, you, you gave an excellent point. All I have to do is uh, expand on your existing point a little bit. Um, okay. Yeah, that's good though. Well, I want you to do that. we're going to do all that after the break. And Sister Angel ain't done. She can try to pretend like she's done. She ain't <laughs> done. So <laughs> we're going to take a break here and we're going to come back. I'm about Derek Prince. I'm <laughs> oh, man. Well, well, we'll come back and do some more of that then, right here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends as we continue to have our discussion on whether or not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, someone blood bought, blood, wa blood washed, uh, the, the Holy Ghost dwells on the inside of them. Whether or not they can be possessed by the devil. So please join us after by this. By demons. Short... Lowly demons. Yeah, well, demons, not even devils. Devil. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right after the break. Thank you. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Thank you for staying with us here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends. Coming back after the break. Um, we were just talking about, and you know, I want to share this with with everybody here because we were we were saying how when we find out we're in error on a subject, and we were all in agreement on this, and and, and I think this is why. And I'm not. Oh gosh, I hate when I go to say stuff, and it almost sounds like just like a tad self-serving, or in some way, you know, like you're pumping yourself up. It because it's not for me. It's not. I'm telling you. Okay, let me just give my disclaimer because I always do this whenever I go down this road. Full disclosure, okay? <laughs> I'm like Paul. I am chief among sinners, okay? Go pick the, the worst sinner in the world. Put Sister Lisa on the top of the list. I don't have any pride concerning that stuff, okay? So, but when I say this, I'm not speaking in pride. I'm telling you the truth about myself. I want to be right, not above everyone else so I can so say, ah, oh, look how smart I am and how much scripture I know. That's a bunch of bunk. That's a bunch of junk and pride. I want to be right so that I'm not wrong and I'm against Christ. Okay, that's what I'm talking about when I say I want to be right. And this is the way we all feel. We want to be right because it's right. We want to be in agreement with Christ. We, wanna, we don't want to be in error. Okay, so if we found out we were saying this, if we found out we were in error on a topic or on a subject, we want a correction. Because if you don't correct yourself, if you don't repent, which is change your mind and get in agreement with the word, you're going to end up in error. And, and, and most people, when they start down that road, they start ending up in grave error. We don't get to wish into the cornfield the things we don't like. We're supposed to get into the scripture and see what the scripture says about it and arrive at the conclusion the scripture does, no matter how we feel about it. And you know what that takes? Spiritual maturity. It does. And, uh, and sadly, sadly, as I was just saying, I, I, I got a meme for that. Granola Christians, fruits. Nuts and flakes. You've got to decide that you're going to be a disciple, which means taught of the Lord. That has nothing to do with, quote, salvation. You got to have salvation to be taught of the Lord, to be his disciple. But that means that you're going to sit at his feet and you're going to learn. How do we do that? Since the living God is seated at the right hand of the Father, he left us something very important. It's called his word. And we're supposed to pour over these scriptures and then rightly divide the truth. And we're supposed to cast aside any assumptions, perceptions, beliefs, doctrine, instruction from preachers that's in error, that's wrong, that runs afoul of the scriptures. And that's what we were just talking about. So that's in full disclosure. While, while we're on break, we really don't take a break. It's like we all run to the bathroom real quick and get a sip of water. And then we come back and we start talking about the things we were just talking about. Because this stuff is important. What we're doing here tonight on Late Night with Lisa and Friends, whatever topic we're covering, we're still earnestly contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And we feel this is pivotal. Because it is literally attacking the authority of the believer and what was won for us by Christ and who we are in Christ. And if a believer can be possessed, and we talked about this just before we went to break, and I'm talking about the way that they're describing possession, and we all in trouble. 
because then Jesus lied. Okay, then we don't have power over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means hurt us. Then, 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 then that's a lie. So how do you get around that when that's the living God who made a declaration? So we've got to properly put this in its place. And that's probably what we're going to be talking about for most of the rest of this broadcast is how Christians can be afflicted, uh, persecuted, vexed. Even invite things into their life, into their surroundings, into their home. But again, it's still not possession the way that they try to make it out to be. And I argue if you see a devil cast out of somebody, that person wasn't saved. Now, you can cast it off of somebody. I think people can wear things like a garment. And I've talked about this before. People get into demonic agreement. And they make these decisions to do things they had no business doing. For example, if you take the scripture where it says, be not drunk with wine. If you go look up the word drunk there, in the Greek, it means begin to be softened. I always always think of it in this regard, being ripe for the picking. Because, you know, have you ever seen any, I was talking to, uh, uh, to my friends last night. In a conversation we were having, if you go and you see any of those liquor stores or they really sell a lot of wine and stuff, you'll see where it says wine and spirits. That's actually what they call liquor spirits. So if somebody is drinking that stuff and the Bible says if you drink and you get drunk, that you're be- you're beginning to be softened, you're opening yourself up to the demonic. OK, and I'm not saying a believer can be possessed. But you can do stuff you wouldn't have normally done because you're under what they call it, under the influence. Now, I do believe the believers can be under the influence of the devil because I've witnessed that mess. But basically, it's because they got into demonic agreement with or without their knowledge. It's with their consent, but sometimes they don't have full knowledge about what's actually transpiring. You know, like you still got Christians that's reading a horoscope. What? Or going to these palm readers or doing stuff along those lines. They ain't got no business doing it. And we see an example of that in the scriptures in Corinthians where they all get admonished to go get their witchcraft books and bring them back and burn them. They have a nice campfire and burn. The Bible says it. The, those witchcraft books were worth 50,000 pieces of silver and roughly in today's value, that's over $1,350,000. That's some pretty expensive witchcraft books. And these were believers. So I'm not saying people can't have stuff in their life that ain't right. And yeah, they should cast the devil out. You got some witchcraft books, a Ouija board. If you if you if y'all if you haven't done it, if you research the history of, of, for example, a deck of cards, playing cards and what those faces mean, all that crap is demonic. You shouldn't even have a deck of cards in your house. <laughs> OK, not that crap. But people don't even know that stuff. And there's all kinds of stuff. People go shopping at at uh, swap meets and outdoor air meets and stuff. And they pick up little statues and stuff and bring that stuff back in their house. They don't know that stuff is cursed. And they wonder why all hell start breaking loose. That kind of stuff, yes, it is real. We're still not talking about the same thing that these people have extrapolated this stuff into, demon possession. Okay, and that's what we're coming again. We're not saying that witchcraft isn't real, that there aren't powerful things that can't happen, that Christians can't be involved in stuff they ain't got no business being involved with. Pornography is powerful witchcraft. Powerful witchcraft. Half of all the internet traffic is porn and that's been since day one so there's powerful witchcraft out there that people can get involved in and yeah they should cast the devil out but we're saying and i do believe this i believe this to my dying day that a believer is still more powerful and at the moment they make the decision to stop that mess because i've heard too many christian men that have said it and they didn't have to go have a devil cast out of them they cast the devil out when they turned off the porn and threw the magazines away OK, so, you know, that's who we're talking about. We're going to get hate and there'll be all kind of comments left that I'm going to have to delete later on. So we, we are <laughs> because people are going to be advocating for the devil being more powerful and stronger 
And the devil is a liar. So anyway, I did my little rant here. Now I need a sip of water. So who wants to go? Oh, Ben, you said you had some other things that you wanted to uh, expound on. And, and I can't wait to hear it. So, Brother Ben, please go ahead. Okay, well, Angel made some excellent points already. I mean, she nailed all the all the major points. Just a couple of things like just, uh, you know, things that would uh, augment her argument, I guess, would be. Um, well, one is, you know, the Bible likens um, the man, I, the, the land is the land or the earth or the ground um, is a type for a, 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 a man, essentially. Because after all, man came from the dust of the ground. And so there's a lot of types in the Bible where you see the the land is being used as a type for um, uh, for man. And it, so this comes into play with, with regards to this demon possession discussion because... Um, let me pull up my notes here. Um, well, well, for example, the type for a man, again, man came from the dust of the ground. The parable of the sower likens the heart of a man as soil. So there's different types of soil and, and, and the heart has different levels of receptivity of the, the, of the seed. And that seed is the word of God. And so like, obviously the, the word of God can bring new life and it, it can grow us spiritually. Um, but also too, like even the Abrahamic covenant, which is you know comprised of a, of a promised land or national Israel, uh, it, it's a promise of sea of land, seed, and blessings. Um, so again, you see where uh, the land is a a type for for um, the the man essentially, and I, I even even under um, like for example in Genesis thirteen where Abraham is given the land. Um, God says to him, lift your eyes down and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I I give to you and your descendants forever. And then he basically says uh, after that, arise, walk walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Um, and so I get it. I see that it's, it's basically, you know, God's basically saying, okay, this is the new... That that new land, that promised land, essentially is the is the promised new new man, and it's it's a it's a type for walking in the spirit, essentially. Um, and then also, the uh, like Hebrews, for example, talks about the the uh, the the word of God, uh, which is I believe he's referring specifically to the the to the Hebrew the the epistle of Hebrews being like rain that waters the ground, and if it if it you know if it if the ground gives up, uh, you know. Fruit, uh, a harvest or uh, things that are good that the land is blessed but if it uh, yields thorns and thistles which again I think it's a, is a type for that person becoming hardened in their unbelief and, and going back to uh, to the law that that believer can be uh, that that ground is near to being cursed or burned and again it, it means burned up like you know and this is an old agricultural technique in the in the ancient world where uh, when the ground was so useless, it just bore it, it. You know, it yielded only thorns and thistles. They would burn it, and 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 then it would uh, allow it to uh, the next season to uh, hopefully uh, uh, yield a useful crop. So it's a, it's a picture of temporal punishment, but that's that's not my point. Um, it also, to you know, for example, it says that Christ was a a tender plant uh, from dry ground. Um, and it, the, the, like in Malachi, for example, says all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, wickedly will be stubble and the day which is coming shall burn them up and that uh, it will leave them neither root or branch. Um, but they're just uh, all over throughout the Bible. Again, the, the, there's Bible, the Bible verses likens uh, the human, uh, a, a man as a, uh, as, as, a, as, as a type for, for the land or the land being a type for the man. So you have the parable of the sower, like I mentioned, all throughout uh, Matthew, for example, Christ talks about uh, make the tree good uh, or, or, you know, make the tree evil or make the tree good or, you know, a, a good tree, only a good tree can bear good fruit and a rotten tree can bear rotten fruit. Again, that's a picture of the, the land and the heart condition. And, you know, do you basically, it's saying, when he says make the tree good, he's basically saying be converted as a small child and let, let something new displace the old. Uh, and that's really what Angel was talking about, too, with regards to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The reason I mention all this is that, um, you know, when it comes to the idea of demon possession, you know, uh, one of the things that Christ did 
when he, you know, again, when he first came in his first ministry, he kept on saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he first came to offer the Jews the kingdom of heaven if they would only accept the king. But they didn't, so the kingdom was postponed, and I believe it's it's yet future in the millennium. Um, and But before the king came, uh, or before the, the kingdom of heaven was coming, uh, John the Baptist prepared the, the, the land. He prepared the people's hearts to receive the king. And so they would confess sins. Uh, so that's, again, that's kind of a way of casting away your sins or what's what's unclean from the land or from your heart. Um, and then also J Jesus literally, and it sent out 72 of his disciples throughout the land, specifically with the authority to cast out demons. So again, that's a picture of cleansing the land before the kingdom could be ushered in. Um, and, uh, and again, when, when we, uh, we, when we are saved, uh, again, all, all ownership, well, actually, let me go back to the, the, uh, the, uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, or I'm sorry, the, um, the, where Jesus, uh, said, you know, only a strong man can uh, cast out a strong, a stronger man can cast out a strong man, and then he'll plunder his goods. Um, again, that's a type for, again, the land, where G that that whole parable, I believe, essentially is a parable about Israel. He's saying, okay, I just cast all the demons out of the land, and unless you accept your king into the land, uh, the, the, the only the, the demons are going to come back worse. Israel, if you reject the king, the greater thing, the thing that's merciful, uh, you know, grace, you you reject grace, essentially, the king, is, whose grace is personified, um, if you reject that, then Oh, you know, oh, the Israel's state is going to be latter than than the first. It, the latter is going to be worse than the first. And again, that's a picture of a believer when they are saved and the Holy Spirit indwells them. Everything essentially, uh, all the evil forces that are uh, that bind that person, um, you know, again from an eternal perspective, are bound. The, the, all those things that that kept that person in binded. Uh, in bondage, they are bound up, and and and, and then you could you know, again, Christ plunders that ma that man, um, and so again, that's also a picture of believer. So when uh, I'm saying this because I probably might make a whole lot of sense because my notes are all scattered and I thought I was a little bit more prepared, but whatever. Um, the when when the New Jerusalem comes uh, it comes down from heaven, um, again, the, the one of the things of a whole the whole purpose of the tribulation. One of the main purposes of the tribulation is if God intends to break the power uh, in the stubbornness of, of, of the of His people, and so, uh, for example, in Ezekiel it says, um, uh, "It says, I will I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant." Again, one of the main purposes of the of the tribulation, I believe, is to prepare the Israel uh, essentially to receive its king and the kingdom. And so it says, I will purge the rebels from among you, and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell, but they shall not enter the land of Israel. When you, Then you will know that I am the Lord. And it also, again, all throughout the Matthew parables, Christ is, uh, uh, the, again, the man who is weeping, and where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, those people are cast out of the kingdom. So... I, so the pain people are, are going to say, since you are Christ's eternal possession, uh, are they going to say, okay, in, in eternal eternity future, in the new in the regeneration, that there's going to be demons crawling around? No, it, it all evil is going to be disposed of and 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 uh, subjected to His will. So there's God doesn't do things in vain. Um, when he cleans out a temple, it's it's cl it's cleansed out. Now you might say, "Oh, the old, old Testament they defiled the temple." Well, again, that was that was not that was Israel under the law under the new covenant. Again, we're sealed forever, and um, and again, when Christ, you know when Christ's seal, uh, tomb was sealed, it, it was uh, sealed so that it would prove that there there was no tampering, no, nothing entered in and nothing entered out. And so we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Again, there's no tampering with that seal. You can't undo that seal. And and so nothing can come in and come out. And only when it was only an angel from God who was allowed to remove that stone uh, when the time was right. But um, what other? Th okay, so a couple other things I was going to say here. Let me pull. Anyone else want to jump in here for a second? I, I'm going to look at my notes here. Um, well, okay, okay. I think. Uh, Oh, also well, too, no, I was, 
No, well, no, I, no I, go ahead, man. Please. Okay, in the epistles, there's you know, it, I think it's it, it's it's also important, you know, not not just what the Bible talks about, but what it doesn't talk about. There's nothing in the epistles which are written specifically specifically to the church about warning the believers how to avoid demon possession or even how to cast out demons. Um, I I believe demon possession, frankly, is um. Uh, it is it, it, it? I don't rule it out. That's a possibility today. Uh, it's it very likely probably is, but um, I think it's it, it's not uh, as common as people think it is. Again, the in the Old Testament, wherever there's law, wherever there's law, that's where you're going to see the most uh, evil. Because again, uh, the uh, the uh, the law arouses sin. And that's where, again, I think that's, you know, before Israel entered into the um, land, they said it was a land that devoured its inhabitants, because that's what the law does. It devours people. It bites, it bites and devours people. And again, I don't think it's any coincidence in Canaan, before Israel even entered the land, and history attests to this, there was all kinds of wicked, that's, that's where you find the most, uh, you know, vile practices of uh, in vile religions of all time, and again, I think it was a picture of what the law does to people, um, and that's why again it was uh, it was that's where you saw um, again it was a land that devoured its inhabitants, um, and so you know the law kind of arouses and attracts sin, and and so and that's why I think part of the reason that Israel was so demon possessed, I think it was particularly demon possessed in that day. Uh, again, it's because it's, it's a picture of what happens to the the body or the the land is a picture of the, a, a type for a man that happens when when you are uh, under the law and and uh, that you're only hoping it just becomes makes you more sinful and so it's particularly uh, demon possessed in, in Christ's day and then even in Revelation it talks about the Babylon being the the cage for every foul bird and you know, unclean spirit um, and and so also too you know demons are unclean spirits and so when when Peter saw you know, one of the things that with Peter's vision, we saw the the unclean foods being, you know, coming down from heaven. And God said, "Don't call uh, what, uh, what don't call unclean what I've made clean." Uh, well, that's basically again, that's also a picture of what the Gentiles don't call the Gentiles unclean if I make them clean. Uh, and that's a picture of the food, you know, for example, as a type for. And uh, again, people who believe demons can possess people are saying that they can be unclean again. They can be uh, inhabited by unclean spirits. Again, they're saying they're calling uh, unclean what God has called clean. Um, and again, there's nothing in the epistle about demon possession, how to avoid demon possession. All it talks about is not give Satan a foothold. But a foothold again is is basically you know getting his foot in the door. But it's it's not a, a door into your body, but a door into your life essentially. Uh, I do believe Satan and his demons can afflict uh, the flesh um, and, and influence people. Um, and for example, Ananias and Sapphira, I know some people don't believe that they were believers. I believe the evidence is that they were believers. One of the primary evidences is that, uh, after they were, uh, judged, everyone, uh, there was great fear that swept through all the churches. Well, there, there would no, be no reason for, uh, the fear to sweep the churches if they know, if they thought that, you know, oh, that was just an unbeliever. I'm a believer. No, I think they feared because it, it, it was basically what, uh, it's a, it, it basically fulfilled what would uh, or not fulfilled, but it says in Revelation that I am the, you know I'm the one who searches the hearts and minds, uh, and so it's a it, it God was showing His church yet, and there's nothing that you know that's hidden from me. I'm the one who searches the hearts and minds, and they Ananias and Sapphira they allowed Satan to fill their heart. But again, I don't think Satan a Satan, Satan entered it. It's just that they were allowed Satan to influence uh, their heart. Um, and uh, also, too, uh, with a lot of demon possession, too, people will say things like, oh, well, see, I, I know this person's a believer, and I saw this this person being demon-possessed. Well, uh, first of all, um, are they really believers? Are they, uh, and do they have the true gospel? Again, uh, almost all the people who believe that uh, b believers can be demon-possessed also have a false gospel. I would say 99.999 are the people who believe that de believers can be demon possessed also hold to a false gospel of works, or they don't hold people to the criteria where like they need to actually understand grace and ceasing from their works. Like they will say a believer is just anybody who believes Jesus is the Son of God and that you right. know he 
live, died, and rose again. But like they don't they don't require that part where the people understand what that accomplished, right? And this is a, a, a difficult subject. I mean, it's very hard to pin down what someone believes, but we do know it is very hard for people to trust entirely on the finished work of Jesus. I mean, this is a big, big ask, right? So you can't really know, uh, especially someone you don't know very well, right? Uh, especially just somebody that you saw in a deliverance, you know, uh, uh, production uh, that, you know, like, oh, you just assume that you know exactly what their profession of faith is and that, and that they're really believing what they say they're believing, which I mean, I think we are just supposed to go off of profession, but if, if you really, I mean, because you can't even know whether they were really possessed or not. You can't really even know that unless you see some like impossible stuff happening, I guess. But th the point is, is whatever you see in that church going on, whatever production you see, that doesn't negate the word of God and what it says. Right. So you can't look at, at what you saw Derek Prince do or whatever and decide to base your interpretation of doctrine on that in contradiction to what you see in scripture you can't do it you'll have to you know ask god to show you uh how to reconcile the two things but the you know the last thing you do is is to go off of of what your eyes you know told you and what an, a man told you instead of what the bible says um you know i uh i do think people take demon possession too lightly i think that they you know i, I don't know if it's because maybe it's 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 convenient to blame a de like demonic possession for a habit you can't give up or something like that. I, I don't really understand it, but the last thing I want to do is, is assume that, I mean, this would be a horrifying prospect if, if people were just helpless against, against, you know, mm -hmm. having demons enter them and take control of them. I mean, the cases where we can, we can at least, you know, guess really were, especially just in the Bible, look at the man in the tombs. I mean, that, what a horrific fate. Demons can do that mm -hmm. to you if they possess you. Are you? Do you really believe God would allow that to happen to to His children, to those who are set apart by Him? I mean, and then there'd be no possible solution. And like, even if you think there is, like, oh well, you need to avoid sin, and you need to. Do, the Bible didn't even tell you what the solution was to prevent that from happening. It didn't even right. think to tell you. Because, I, is it because God just didn't didn't get to it? He didn't think it was important to tell you how to how to protect yourself as a believer from demonic possession. Surely they want to be possessing believers constantly. Surely right. that would be their favorite Absolutely. target. Think of the damage they could do. Yeah. So he would tell you, um, and yet there's just so very little that you could even misconstrue as that kind of instruction. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what an oversight. What a right. massive right. oversight on God's part. And I don't think that's the God I know. I mean, you know, the God I know, you know, made every provision for me. And he has my back. Mm -hmm in ways mm -hmm. I can't even describe, couldn't even hope to describe mm -hmm. that he's had my back and like, like a, like a, like a friend, you know, even in things where it's like, like, what, you know, why would you even help me here? You know, but it's like a mm -hmm. trust building thing, really more than anything. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for him to do something, you know, only he could have done. And yeah. Show and even in the little things too. Yeah. yeah and and I would I consider demon possession a big thing. You know, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and Why I wanted to ask Ben what he thinks about the abomination of desolation and like how that factors into what you're talking about, about about what um, because I agree. I agree that uh, the verse I cited about, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, spoiling the strong man's house, that the, the, that actual passage is, 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 is referring to Israel. There's, it's talking about Israel. But the point is, is that geez, it's like it has to also be true. In the context with which it's applied, I think, you know, because he wouldn't be giving this metaphor if the metaphor in and of itself wasn't true. And if it and mm -hmm. if the different ways you can extrapolate it aren't also true, true on every level, like we like to say. So but I but I think that's a great insight. And I don't think God gives incomplete asymmetrical shadows and types and pictures. He, he's very, uh, you know, uh, symmetrical in everything. Everything is, is perfect. So if, um, you know. Well, if it's a principle that's an overarching principle, it's going to apply perfectly, no matter which way that you, you know, you apply it, uh, especially in things that the Bible actually covers. But I wonder what you thought about the abomination of des desolation, you know, and, and the Antichrist, you know, sitting in the temple declaring himself to be God and maybe how that might even apply. Well, I would uh, say somehow. first, well, first of all, that the, the abomination of desolation uh, would happen, uh, uh, whatever happens to that temple, uh, 
it, it uh, it's before God actually steps foot into it, so it wouldn't be really defiling anything that uh, was it wasn't clean yet, essentially, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, Paul Peter says in First Peter four that uh, the judgment begins at the house of God, and again, these were Jewish people who were of the dispersion. They were not even in Jerusalem. They were out in the in in foreign countries, and he says that. Uh, we, it, it, you know, judgment starts at the house of God, and it starts with us first. You know what's going to be happening of the sinner, uh, what's going to be left of the sinner, essentially. And so, mm-hmm. we are we are the house of God. So, um, and even in the Old Testament, yes, like Antiochus Epiphanes put the pig a pig's head in the temple, but again, God's uh, presence in that temple would come and go. You know, and uh, right. it was it wasn't permanently sealed like it is now. It's not. It was. It was again. It was a temporal. Right. It was temporal glory, temporary glory. We are. We we are, have the new covenant, which is eternal glory. That that glory was passing, uh, just like Moses's face. Um, but also too, one it thing doesn't that, have like, to be renewed with sacrifices and all right, that. Right. Right. And all those things were just shadows. Why it is different. Right. Yeah. That would. And that's why I say that. That's why because I was thinking somebody could try to figure out a way where that. Oh well, look. See the abomination that, that makes desolate. Well, see the. The Antichrist comes and he chases God away. You know, it made the it made the temple desolate, but it's not the it's not the same thing. And just like you said, God, you know, God could either come and go, but he, you know, in in the old system in the in the the uh, right. carnal right. representation of the temple. Whereas we know that um, that was not meant to that was not meant to uh, to suggest to us that he comes and goes from the temple uh, right. that he always right. intended to dwell in in the first place. Right, he'll never leave um, us or forsake us. Uh, that's yes. what he promised yeah but, now, let, let me let me interject a couple of things real quick before i forget sure. okay because i'm not good at taking notes like ben is <laughs> ben will have his notes and they're on speed dial he can call them up but for me <laughs> i was like uh where did i write that on a napkin or something so uh two quick things the first was i said it before i'll say it again and i'll never get tired of saying it just because you can point to ten thousand counterfeits does not invalidate the genuine article we find the genuine article in the scriptures, and that's what we are supposed to point to and reference. I'm not concerned about the counterfeits. Counterfeits just prove the genuine article when we find it. We go, oh, see, look, this is genuine, and here's why. And we look in the scripture to find that as believers. So when we see a counterfeit, it's easy to identify because we have familiarized ourselves with what is authentic, number one. Number two, uh, I would like to say, um, getting on the subject of habits, and this is something we haven't talked about. Now, our flesh, you've often heard it said, we are creatures of habit, okay? Most of us get into daily routines, even in our lives, the things that we do. I mean, from the time that we were children, your parents begin to train you. That's what the Bible says, train up a child in the way that they should go. When they are old, they will not depart from it. So we get into this training mode where we have a, 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 a sort of a ritual, if you will, for lack of a better term, that we do, whether it's wash our face and brush our teeth and all this and, and take a bath and get ready for bed. And then we, we have the whole thing, right? Dinner, the whole thing. In most houses with structure, that's what happens, okay? And you, have, you get your children prepared for life and how they have to do things. I still hear my mother's voice to this day about certain <laughs> certain things. Like one of my favorite things is when I want to hit the alarm clock for like the second or third time to hit the snooze button. And her voice would say to me when I was a child and I did that, <laughs> you might as well get up. It's not going to get any easier. <laughs> so um, this is just the nature of being human. But we have to be careful as believers not to allow things that become rituals that are that are really antichrist. And sadly, too many Christians do. We have to be careful with that. Number one. Number two is being that we the flesh does like its rituals and does like its habits. Just like there can be good habits, there can be bad habits. And so let's talk about let's talk about that for a second. Uh, ben, and I hope I'm not, not, not knocking you out of pocket here. We can always come back to whatever it is you want to say. But um, when I spoke about just earlier about that there are believers, Christian men, and, and that I'm not putting Ben on the spot here because Ben is, has extolled and spoken about this before. It's, it's not a secret. So I'm not, un, I would never do that to any human being I know. 
okay, throw them under a bus about something that I knew that was private that they didn't want to make public. Ben has already made this public that he used to have a trouble with porn, okay, and he overcame that. He didn't have a devil cast out. So <laughs> this is this is a, a good example, and I've heard other men that were believers say the same thing, that once they made the decision, see, the first thing they did was get in agreement with God and his word. First of all, that it was sin, that they ain't had no business doing it. And then the second is they began to make a plan of action as to how to get it out of their life. They identified the problem. They recognized it as a problem in sin. They, they owned the fact that it was sin. They rebuked it, got it out, renounced it. This is wrong. I want this out of my life. And they did it. And they didn't spend, you know, now I heard one gentleman's testimony. He had struggled with it for 30 years because he had never made the decision properly. But once he came to that, he cast the devil out himself. Okay. And it wasn't out of his person. It was out of his life because he was in agreement with it. Because then nobody make them press play. Now, I've heard Ben give his own testimony about that. So I'm not throwing him under the bus by saying any of this stuff. So this is what I'm talking about. If a believer, because you have the power that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has given you, makes the decision that they're going to take a stand against the enemy. As Megan was pointing out in Ephesians 6. And stand on his word and stand on his promises and operate in authority that's given us as a believer. They're able to cast the devil out of their life themselves. Now, if you are weak, if you feel that you are weak and you are just being bombarded by the devil in an area of your life, there is nothing wrong with going to other saints of God. The Bible tells us that and that we get into prayer and and standing in the gap for these people and supplication on their behalf and rebuking and binding the devil for them. Because sometimes people do allow themselves to get so beaten down by the devil. Because of their own agreement, their own um, flaws, faults, inadequacies, however you want to describe it, not attacking the person. They're weak. They can't fight it. So then they ask for help. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. But uh, this whole concept, and we've already went on it. So those of you joining us now, please just go back, start the broadcast over when you when you get a chance and listen because we've already covered as to why we believe according to scripture it is not possible for a born again believer to be possessed from the inside by the devil. We do agree that people can allow things into their life, they can get in agreement with certain things, they can bring things into their home, they can open up portals, different stuff like that, but not possession. We say if you see the devil cast out of somebody in a service, that person was not saved. Okay. Now, a demon can be cast off of a person, okay, but not out of a believer. Unbelievers, yes. Uh, so there's people that sold out for the devil. And believers still have authority over them. And most of them won't even, if a person is demon possessed, most of them won't even want to get in within 100 feet of a believer. I have literally witnessed with my own eyes situations where I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything, quote, spiritual. All right. I'm not like in a church service or anything. I remember one time I was about 12, 13, 14 years old, somewhere in there. And I was shopping with my mother. And this woman walked past us. We're literally in the aisle shopping. You know how you do. You're looking at clothing on the rack and we're looking at different stuff. And she's on the next aisle over. But it was it was like just chest high clothing. So I could clearly see her and she cut her eyes at me like she wanted to kill me. And it frightened me because I'm only like, I'm, I'm just a child. And I got a little bit closer to my mama and said, mama, that woman looked at me like she want to kill me. My mother, this is what I love about being around believers that know who they are. She didn't even look at the woman. She's just flipping the clothes. She said, baby, that ain't her. That's the devil in her. Just rebuking by the devil. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you the truth. That's exactly what happened. So, y'all, let's let's just remember 
what the Bible says in its in, in its entirety in the new covenant. We're new covenant saints. You can refer to the old covenant for structure and understanding, but the old covenant is the new covenant concealed. The new covenant is the old covenant revealed. Jeremiah 31, 31, go read it for yourself. He, he promised there was a new covenant coming. Said exactly what it was going to be, and then he's going to write it on our hearts. And part of that was to remove our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Now, Brother Ben, I'm going to go back to you, but I wanted to cover that because I think we should talk about habits because habits are one of the things I think people are confusing <laughs> with some form of possession. But we can do things that we just got used to doing that are not good for, the, for, good for us that are bad. And there have been studies done. And y'all go research this for yourself. I was talking to my friends about this uh, last night, how They've done studies that's determined that a person, if they do anything for 21 days, whether it's good or bad, it will become a habit. And most of us have had the experience, whether it was with smoking or alcohol or whatever it was, initially, you didn't even like it. You didn't even want it. It was like, ugh. But you just kept doing it because either your friends were doing it or it seemed cool or whatever the reason was you talked yourself into and then after 21 days, that thing became a habit, and now you got a bad habit. Okay, I don't know. Uh, when it comes to some of this stuff, because people are like, oh, you know, is everything really, is everything the devil, really? When Paul says all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. So that means everything ain't good just because you can do it. So, you know, we have to examine ourselves, and this is one you see a case where the Paul lays out and says, hey, we shouldn't do things that might, even though we have the liberty to do, might cause our brother or sister in Christ to stumble. Okay? And as Sister Angel so astutely pointed out, where's the admonishment in the scripture against demon possession and how to avoid it in the new covenant? Because you don't see it. It's literally completely absent. So then that means we have the power to defeat even bad habits. But because, you know, it's that old expression and you've seen it over and over again. There are, there's a billion testimonies like this anywhere in the world online. You can find them when a person, even if they're not saved, makes a quality decision that they want to change something in their life, a bad habit. They can do it just because they made the decision. Well, then how much more for a believer who has the power, the resurrection of power of Christ for real? So some of us just get lazy and we don't want to do the work that it takes to stop doing crap. We ain't got no business doing. That's also a part of it. But if you can believe the Jedi mind trick <laughs> that everything is the devil and that he's more powerful than you, well, then how convenient to remain in a habit that you probably like anyway or you wouldn't be doing it. Now, I can't look into your heart, your life. I don't want to. <laughs> really, I'm telling you, I don't. I got my own issues and problems and things that I deal with in my life. I got enough on my plate. So I don't invite people to write me and email me and tell me all your business. I don't want to know your business. You ask for prayer, I'll pray for you. But how much of this stuff do we do to ourselves? How much of it is just bad habits and we just being lazy and ornery and secretly really want to keep doing that thing, but we want to claim we don't want to do it anymore because it's convenient and it feels good to the flesh. I don't know. I can't look into your heart. You're going to have to answer that for yourself. But it's mighty funny to me that when believers get sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Or can I say it without y'all getting mad? Can I say it? Satan's be And when you get tired of that. Because you are literally letting him do these things to you. Because you have the power of Christ. And when you get tired of it. You say enough is enough. Devil. Not today, devil. How they're able to get rid of stuff just because they made a quality decision to walk in the authority and the power they already have as believers. OK, Ben, I want you to go back to whatever point it was you want to make before I so rudely cut you off. <laughs> my, my apologies and thank you for your patience. No, I, I, I yeah, I mean, I pretty much hit say what I wanted to say a couple of quick points. I would say, you know, people bring up the case where um, Job was our uh, Satan was in the presence of the sons of God in. In Job, and well, again, if you, I think, 
I think that that's a picture in Job. It's basically the the God is meeting with his divine council, if you will, and it, the divine council are among them are the fallen uh, sons of God who judge the world um, unrighteously. And that's why uh, God had to take Israel as his own inheritance, and then ultimately from it, that uh, reinherit all the other nations. But the nations were divided uh, in uh, <clears throat> at the Tower of Babel. I think it's in Deuteronomy 32 that tells us that that uh, all the nations were divided up, or the sons of God, the num number of nations were divided up, uh, according to the number of sons of God. And in Job, I believe you're seeing a, basically a divine council where God's meeting with those uh, fallen sons of God who judge unrighteously, and among them uh, is Satan. And again, just because God's in the same room as him, or not even in the same room potentially, it could be a, a gulf, it could be a great gulf like uh, there was in Abraham and the uh, rich man, you know. Uh, but either way, uh, they did have uh, some communication. But that's that's a, that's a quite a stretch to say, oh, that's a picture of Satan and uh, or a demon uh, being in the presence uh, or inhabiting um, a uh, a believer. I think that's a quite a stretch. Um, another thing too is, like I mentioned before, an angel mentioned this too, but I think uh, I think you might have cut it off, angel, too early. Um, and that was um, I, with regards to. First Corinthians six, you talked about. Um, you quoted the first, but I, I don't think you caught, caught the last part of it. So I just want to capture that real quick. Where uh, Paul says, "Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body." But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's right. What, I didn't cut it off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. And a couple things about that verse is um, the idea of uh, you know the, the believers were bought as a price. That expression brings to mind the the act of redemption and the outcome of the change of ownership. And so we're no longer sa slaves of sin. Again, that slave terminology in the uh, in the Bible, I think primarily it it, it, it deals with ownership. Uh, yes, you're a slave in terms of your work, but also the prime. But before you can do any work uh, as a slave of God, you need to be owned by Him before you can do any work that's considered. Uh, worthy. Otherwise, it's just filthy rags. But, uh, so yes, you know, the Bible says, you, you know, that we're no longer slaves of sin, but we're slaves of righteousness. Christ is righteousness. He owns us. Uh, our body is, is not even our own, let alone a demon's. It's it's God's. Um, and so, uh, again, I think that's another point that I would hammer home. And then finally, the last thing I would say is with regards to, uh, you know, again, a lot of people, you know, I think, first of all, I think there's a lot of fakery around demon possession. But even if those people, um, you know, you say you're, for example, you're in their church and you think there's, you know, that's irrefutable evidence. I'm seeing someone obviously possessed of a demon. Um, I would say one of two things. Uh, they're, well, they're probably, they could be fake you get, but, um, or they could be, um, they, it could be unbelievers. You So, for example, in Acts even, where they, that uh, girl who had the spirit of Python or Pythia, um, I believe she was an unbeliever. She and uh, she was uh, in, inhabited by a demon, and she was following uh, uh, Paul around and basically telling everyone. Well, pr first of all, she was a fortune teller essentially beforehand, before this whole episode, and then uh, after after she saw Paul preach the gospel, I think she bear, in, in a very mocking uh, the demon in her uh, in a very mocking way was saying, uh, "Listen to these men; they have a way of they tell you the way of salvation," and. Uh, first of all, the demons saying that, uh, you know, it, it's going to probably draw you away from that message, first of all. So that might be part of the tactic. But the other tactic could have been, um, again, it, it was, it, you know, I think maybe perhaps God let her let her do that for a while. Let that demon do it for a while because uh, it was basically a message to even the unbelieving world that even your own fortune tellers are telling you that are, 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 you're not even listening to your own fortune tellers who you previously paid money for uh, to get good fortune here, good fortune, and now uh, this this fortune teller is given to you for free. There's just a lot of mockery and polemic in the spiritual world, and so there's a lot of you know 
uh, back and forth there. So um, again, I, there's no evidence at all that she was she she was she had believed prior to being possessed. None at all. I don't think she even heard the gospel because Paul was just preaching it. Um, and then finally, um, once uh, one demon that um, Christ cast out, uh, you know, they 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 said he, I think the the people said, "Why is she possessed? Or why is this person tormented?" And he said something to the effect, paraphrasing, don't remember all the details, but uh, you know, they're asking, you know, what, what what did her parents do or something? And he said, "This one is not because of her parents, essentially, but." This one is to demonstrate the glory of God. So you see there that God has absolute control over what is possessed, who is possessed, uh, and why would He ever allow a believer to to be possessed? Uh, does He want to share bunk beds with the demon inside a, a person? I don't think so. Um, so just a couple points there that that really uh, hopefully enhance some things the angel said because I thought I thought we really I don't I don't think there's any room. Uh, for uh, uh, the idea that a believer could be possessed. I think it's utter nonsense, and I think it's really heresy. I don't think people have just thought it through at all. Like, I don't think they've thought through all the ramifications of what that would mean and how impossible, like, the Great Commission would be, like, how impossible uh, so many promises, uh, you know, that God made to us, especially about um, the New Covenant, would be if we were... Um, and just at the mercy of demons possessing us all the time. I mean, we would be the number one targets. They could they could constantly uh, make us incapable. And I don't just mean, uh, you know, influence us to be lazy and selfish. I mean, like, like against our will, make us incapable of doing God's will at all. You know? Um, yeah, make us mute so we can't even preach the gospel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They wouldn't even bother possessing the lost. They would just spend all their time messing with us. And, and then also, like what, what Jesus said about casting out one spirit and then uh, having even more and worse spirits return, what would even be the point of deliverance for uh, anyone? You know, right, it, like, I right. guess what? So they could right. leave the gospel and then go right back to being possessed, only this time with even more demons. Guys, right. I just thought of something. <laughs> okay, I just thought of something. Well, watch this, okay? <laughs> That's why I chuckled. I'm sorry. I didn't mean I had my mic was open. How do we know that Christians, according to no, according to this line of thinking, can have demon possession? You know how? We saw it on TV. Now I'm not trying to be funny, but prior to this, this is this is where this stuff came from. People making presentations on TV telling you that there was a devil in a person that was a believer. And so we saw this stuff on TV, people getting, you know, you know, foaming at the mouth and all this stuff, laying out on the floor and all this stuff and demons being called out of, of what's supposed to be saints of God. For real. That's how we saw it. We saw it. And this is where people, why people believe it's real. Now, I told you two arguments. No, devils are real. Demons are real. But either that person is faking and then when you look who it's associated with, which are some of these questionable characters on television, that's one big fat red flag. The other is if they're a genuine believer that is casting the devil out of somebody, that person is not saved. And this is what people think. You see somebody in church, Sunday go to meet and close, religious, don't mean they're saved. So... You know, we gotta we gotta stop that. Just because somebody look right don't mean they are right. And I'm talking about with God. To be born again is how you're right with God. You've made peace with God. This is somebody has on a nice suit and a nice tie and and don't swear and don't cur you know, smoke and drink and all and don't fornicate or run with those that do, don't mean they saved. You better gotta stop that stuff. There's a lot of people that's just religious. And church is like a Christian social club. It's a safe place to be. And uh, I think, see, I saw a lot of that with, with all of this stuff with um, COVID. People who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ were not scared for one second. I'm talking about the trust God now. They weren't scared for one second. And they knew it was complete BS. Now, Oh, I just stepped on everybody because everybody knows somebody now that's died. 
Yeah, but was it from COVID? Because don't forget, they could put anything they want on that death certificate. They could call it COVID. So I have story after story after story of people that I know personally who had someone die in their life. And them doctors put COVID on there and it wasn't COVID. And they know it. They know their family members, what their ailment was. One lady was her husband. She knew every condition he had, what medications he was taking. When he died, it was not COVID related. But you know what they put on that birth, that death certificate? COVID-19. Okay, whatever. Fine. We know they're doing it and they're getting paid extra to do it. And there's been stories out there uh, with people documenting that they're getting paid extra to do it. Fine. The Lord is their judge. They ain't getting away with nothing. It just looks that way. But for the believer... I wasn't scared for one second. I saw right through all this scam, demic, excuse me, pandemic, oh, excuse me, pandemic from the beginning. And people got mad at me for it, and I didn't care. Because the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into your own understanding. So if we're not even supposed to lean to our own understanding. Do you think we're supposed to lean to the world's understanding and explanation of crap? No. So I was never afraid, not for an atomic second. Because my trust was in the Lord. And I told you my attitude is, even if I die, to live as Christ and to die is gain. But I saw Christians going, the droplets are real. It just, it pissed me off to the highest level of pissivity. Because I'm like, you're supposed to be trusting in the Lord. Where is that trust? Do you think that that trust is only when it's convenient? This is what really angered me about this whole thing. And I'll be honest, and I don't care. I've been wanting to say this for over eight months now. I blame the church for this crap. Because the church rolled over and played dead and got into agreement with everything these devils wanted to put forward. Every single thing. We should just go along with what they say. Romans 13. Rolled over and played dead. Yes, men of God. Men of God, all that crap about being men and you got to be a man and all that mess that they lie about. And y'all was the one wearing the mask. All right, whatever. The Bible, you can show them in Corinthians where the Bible says we're supposed to serve our Lord with open face. Oh, but that's just a suggestion. It's not important. It's okay. All right, whatever. You going to bear that. You going to have to answer for what you did. But I don't think that this stuff would have taken hold if the church would have held its ground and would have stood up and said, hell no to the devil. But now we got little children going to school, wearing them demonic masks on their face. And I told y'all, look up the history of mask wearing. It is thoroughly satanic and it is wicked. And what the, the media is not telling you is that crime is on the rise. It is going through the roof. Rapes, murders, carjacking, home invasion. Gee, why do you think that would be? Could it be because you're letting the criminals wear masks? But no, but they'll go ahead. Keep saying the droplets are real. But where's the trust in the Lord? I was, I'm telling you, I've been holding on to this for months. I, I bit my tongue. Except for when I went off a little bit over there on Sister Renee's channel. And I thank God she gave me the grace to do so. I'm sick of this crap. I'm tired of it. Will the real church of the Lord Jesus Christ please stand up? Because I about had enough of this mess. Either we, I don't care about what the world, I expect the world to be doing what they're doing. But believers, please miss me with that noise. I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if it hurts your feelings. Sometimes your paradigm needs to be shattered. Because if your paradigm is based on false, BS, sacred cows, they need to be destroyed. Okay, that's my fire rant for tonight. Y'all took it all out of me tonight, I'm telling you. Because the enemy's lies being received by the church are destroying shipwrecking, and leaving destitute believers who have power over the devil. So who is going to stand up? Now, if we do it, if we ladies, women out there, because they keep telling us about the demonic silence doctrine, why would the Lord 
give us a mouth if he didn't want us to use it. We are supposed to extol the glory of God. The Bible said, unless you're a woman. I've just had it with this crap. I'm like done. In 2021, are we going to be bold witnesses for Christ? Or are we going to be quiet and just let the devil just run amok? We're still here. That means we still got work to do. I'm tired of the mess. You know, when you get afflicted and you have to actually do spiritual warfare against the devil for your own personal health and do battle against the devil. And here you are fighting the devil and praying and trusting God and clinging to his promises. And you see believers with the same authority and the same power, not doing any work, not doing any battle, not standing up against the devil, not contending for the faith. We should just do whatever they say, rolling over, playing dead. Pisses me off. I'm issuing a challenge to all of you listening tonight to make a decision who you believe in this day. Because our God is God. And if you don't believe that, then just go ahead and get you a T-shirt that said Christian in name only. And stop playing games. Because this crap is going on because we've tolerated it and we haven't stood up against the devil. Suborn the language of the enemy. Calling bur murdering babies abortion. Calling child rapists pedophiles. It's wrong. Stop doing it. Stand up. Speak out. Telling the truth is not a crime. Yet, don't worry, they'll get there. They're trying with those demonic Noahide laws that are already in the pike. And Christians, you're the target. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, hear me on this. The time to stand is N-O-W now. Not tomorrow. Now. If you have faith in his name, now faith is. They hate us because we bear his name. Why do you think these fakers with these false names are coming in with all of this demonic trash assaulting the deity of Christ? They had the nerve, the unmitigated gall to put out a movie depicting our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a homosexual. And as all the apostles, the disciples, as homosexuals, the church should have been furious. Roll over. What are you going to do? We just turned the other cheek. Bunch of bump. We're supposed to contend for the faith. And we're supposed to stand up and say, not today, devil. How dare you? When they feel the heat, they see the light. But Christians want to continue to roll over and play dead and get in demonic agreement with the enemy. Enough is enough. And part of it is what we assassinated tonight, which is the lie that a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ can be demon possessed. I hope we put that to bed. I hope we destroyed the enemy's lies on that because that lie has been around for about 50 years now. And all these fakers that have been out there casting the devil out of people. And y'all go research most of these preachers that you see that mess. Watch this. I'm going I'm to show you the proof to show you their faith. Their God is mammon. Everything that they're connected to is about the money. I was just watching a video when he's clowns today over there in Africa. Millionaire. Boy, is he all, he's all about casting the devil out of believers, right? I saw one I know it was a complete act. But what he got? He got what rose silver shadow. They're always connected to money. They're showing you who their God is. So you don't think they put on a show for money? Would y'all please just stop? Everything that you see that these people claim they're Christian, when you research and you put it to the proof text of the word, they show you they're absolute clowns, buffoons, money grubbing devils. And they got some of them clowns right here on YouTube. And everything is about the money. That's how you know. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't give an offering to the man or woman of God. If somebody's laying down their life and they're really doing the work of the ministry and they're trying to help, 
then yeah, throw them some love. You eating from their table, throw them some love. I ain't got no problem with that. But when you see somebody who's all about the money, somebody out there wearing four or five thousand dollar suits and two thousand dollar pair of shoes and all of that craziness, they're letting you know who they are. They're putting it right in your face. Just note and avoid. You ain't got to do no expose videos. Just note and avoid. And just warn others, hey, you better watch out. They love money. Better watch out. Jesus told us what to look for. You can't serve both. Now, I think I did my rant. Y'all don't warn me. I'm telling you. You warn me out tonight. But we needed to talk about that. I just can't take it. I just, I can't. It was been bottled up. I can't take it. And I've been waiting and waiting and waiting. Because, you know, I'm saying, look at, we got all these men who claim they're men of God. Are they going to say something? Are they going to say something? Is they going to use some of that testosterone to say something? No, they're the ones wearing the mask. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can't. I can't. So, okay. That's my stick for tonight. I don't know if, you know, I done beat, beat <laughs> I think that horse is dead. I done beat it with the stick. Uh, but enough is enough. Believers, can the, can the real body of Christ, can they stand up? Can we, can we just stand like Ephesians 6 said? Can we just stand? I Sister, I mean, it's so <laughs> it really is. It's embarrassing. I agree with being obedient and humble and maybe not like, oh, I'm not going to put a mask on people. I want people to know, like, you know, I'm not stupid. Like, I understand the argument, but it just, you know, when it really, all it amounts to is a whole bunch of people going along with satanic mockery of of the population which is what's happening like if every christian decides that what god wants me to do is be obedient to this act of faithlessness in him which is what it is i have to wear this mask because it'll save my life as if god isn't in control of whether you live or die i mean that's what it is that's a symbol of faithlessness um uh because it, you know not to mention you know trust in like blind trust in the world I mean, we didn't really get any of that stuff from scripture in terms of of any of what they're telling us and so when I see these, you know, these fearful people, ma you know, masking their faces and men, so many men doing it, you know, I don't even have hope for women, you know, most women to, to, to strike out, you know, and, and be the one that sticks out. It's like not in most women's nature to, <laughs> to want to go against the grain like that. But when the men do it, it's just like. There's no hope left. I mean, it looks so pathetic. It looks so pitiful. And, you know, young, healthy men. And it is, it is, just, it's a very just similar mentality um, because uh, those in the church, they don't know who they are in Christ um, and they're not trusting God enough. I mean, if you, you, how could you though, if you think, you know, God will let demons possess you? I get it. You know, you probably should also wear the mask, <laughs> right? If you think that, if you think that God will let demons possess you, you should probably keep that mask on too. Well, how is it, though, that the science behind what they're telling us is science, okay? Um, I'm supposed to believe that an infant, an infant is the, the most vulnerable creature on the earth. It's safe, but a 250-pound linebacker isn't? Miss me with that noise forever. But okay, all right, whatever. I, I guess... Not only is reading comprehension gone, but the brain that God gave us no longer works either. Uh, Sister Victoria, I hope I didn't scare you away. Um, I, I'm calm now. I'm, I'm calm down. I had to get that out of my system because there's just so much ridiculousness I've seen. And I, I don't expect anything from the world, y'all. That just that didn't bother me. They don't trust the Lord. But the people who say they trust the Lord was the ones... I'm not talking about saying I'm just going to do it because I don't want to fight to go in the store. Okay, there's an argument for that. Whatever. I get it. I'm talking about literally like coming out going, we should do it because, you know, the droplets are, I mean, I heard Christian, the droplets are real. We could all die. And what are you talking about? But uh, uh, Sister Victoria, if you stood here, if I didn't scare you away, would you, would you like to say something in closing this evening? I think I scared her away. All right, brother Ben. <laughs> yeah, brother give Ben. Give her a minute. Brother Sometimes ben. it's hard to unmute right away if I you're know. not with the <laughs> I think I scared her away. I think I scared her away. <laughs> no, I don't usually scare her away with my rant. She usually gets fired up. Although, uh, Sister Victoria might have needed to turn in early tonight. Gina, I think she was up cleaning her house. 
and working hard earlier today. Brother Ben, would you like to say something in closing this evening? Uh, just in the last couple of minutes, I've been splaying a, a, an article I found that John MacArthur, uh, how much he makes like from a salary, and, and he, he's got like three multi-million dollar homes, uh, and he, he rails against prosperity Only preaching. Three? Yeah, but it's just funny because like, even the people that, you know, that you can't, you can't, yeah, I mean, the spiritual world is very deceptive, you know, you you can't, you gotta be, you really do have to be careful, I mean, you really do have to exercise all your discernment, all the discernment that, that God gives you as a believer, um, and make good decisions uh, about the reality, we're at war, you know, and yeah, war yeah. Always, isn't always clean or fair, uh, in fact, it's it never clean, it's never fair, um, and so, just a lot of deception out there in general, um, and uh, but I I'm very pleased that uh, we we nailed this uh, topic today. I think we did, anyways. Uh, nailed it pretty. Uh, I think it nailed it down. Put the final nail in the coffin. Uh, hopefully, uh, but there are people who you are going to believe what they want to believe, and and I think it's because they want to believe it, not because the Bible teaches it. Uh, but be but it, it, they are actually against the Bible in that respect, and and uh. I don't know if they do it based on feelings or they have itching ears or not, um, but I'm thankful for the three of you and Victoria that and the people in, in the fellowship here uh, that we are only interested in the truth. That's all I care about. I don't care how ugly it is uh, or how, how how hard it is. I mean, I've been through hell and back, so to speak, in terms of having my paradigm shattered over and over and over again. Um, and I'm I'm always challenging myself to, like you like you said, Lisa, uh, you know, challenge myself to. You know, really understand the reality that we're in, and and just just ex accepting the reality, and and uh, really trying to grasp it. You know, in terms of, wow, this is this is not a game. You know, this is not a game at all. And uh, mm -hmm. to get serious, get get very serious, and be very sober. Um, I know that's something that I've been didn't come to me naturally. It's something I've been working on, but um, lately I've been very very sober, very serious, and. Um, I think it's a point we all need to get to at some point. Uh, again, to be good, to be good soldiers for Christ. Again, a good soldier for Christ is Peter. Uh, I think as Paul said to Timothy, does not get caught up in the affairs of this world. Um, so we need to be, you know, we need to have everything focused on the centered on the gospel. All our activities, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we That's lost it. Victoria. She's no longer here. Um, okay, Sister Angel. What would you like to say in closing tonight? Well, you know, I just, uh, I'm glad we at least got one person that was willing to, you know, uh, give, you know, give us their best shot, at least in terms of defending this, this, this teaching. Um, I know I'm sure I you'll get many, uh, uh, I'm sure you'll get many dissenters on your channel, <laughs> on your channel to get. Yeah, we'll video. see. Hopefully I couldn't believe it. Like, I can't believe the Derek Prince video is the one that keeps getting the most, responses um and the most like you know just it's been you know it's quite old but it's like it just keeps drawing people in and and i have uh 31 likes and 21 dislikes which should tell you something i mean that's a bit alarming mm -hmm. isn't it 21 people disagree you know compared to 31 who agree like or you know that actually bothered to like it so that's uh that told me that it really needs to be addressed and um i you know I don't know what to tell people. I mean, especially after what we've said here, you know, the only thing we could do is, is wait for somebody to rebut a single, a single thing we said tonight and then go from there. But uh, I don't really think there is an argument. I think we do have a case of itching ears with people who choose to believe this stuff. It might just be exciting. Like I said, you know, maybe it's like, <laughs> you know, maybe it's like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer complex where they, mm -hmm. they are excited by it. And like Derek Prince is like Giles. You know, <laughs> like he's got all the intel on 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 the on how they operate and what you got to do. But it's not really much fun if you don't have to be afraid of them, right? You know, I don't mm -hmm. know. I mean, I just can't really figure out the mentality behind wanting to believe something so so ghastly and so awful, I and mean, that would be so terrifying. And and that you know, raising your children up as believers, you could offer them no comfort, no comfort mm -hmm. whatsoever. You know, they they if they're believers and they they're you know, you teach them the Bible, then they would obviously know about demons, the demonic possession, and and you couldn't tell them God would not let that happen to you. I can't imagine. I can't imagine because right. uh, I know what it's like to be afraid of that. When I was a kid, I was I was truly afraid, and I think that fear kept me 
in a lot of situations where I might otherwise <sighs> really uh, pay the price for flinging open doors and messing with things I, d I didn't really know what I was getting into. There was a healthy fear of the demonic. You know, that was what eventually caused me to stop dabbling with, uh, with Wicca when I was in like fourth and fifth grade is I realized this might just be a trick that demons use to lure us in to inviting them into our lives. Same with the Ouija board. And, you know, this was a, a, somebody who hated the Bible and was an unbeliever, allegedly, but I knew that in my gut. And that fear is what kept me, you know, and I believe God's, God's provision and his blessing, which, by the way, was in no small part due to the fact that my parents and my family were saved and sealed believers, um, you know, protected me. Uh, I'm not saying I didn't have something, you know, spiritual attachments, but, you know, the way that, the, the you know, a little nine-year-old getting like full blown into like, you know, I did the Holy Guardian Angel ritual when I was like, like nine or 10, the Alistair Crowley. I didn't know. I didn't know what kind of monster he was. I knew who he was though. I thought he was a mm -hmm. genius and I did his Holy Guardian Angel ritual to, to the best of my ability. I'm sure that there was a lot more like <laughs> blood and guts involved in that ritual than the, the book actually reflected. But that's a ritual that is supposed to basically possess you. It's supposed to, um, your Holy Guardian Angel is your, is your demon you know, or worse, that you're personally inviting to take control of you. And I didn't know that that's what it was, but uh, I I just chose it because it didn't require like a weird naked ritual bath, like so many of these other weird wicked stuff that I saw in these books that was all so creepy to me. And that should have been a hint. But that fear is what caused me to put it down and be like, this is not a good idea, um, which mm -hmm. I shouldn't have known better as, a, as somebody who's an atheist. Uh, you know, or so I, so I said, which is kind of stupid, honestly, like, you know, I, I really wasn't thinking that one through with what I was, <laughs> what I was interested in. But the point is, is that, like, I, <laughs> I know that this, this, this is why I didn't sleep alone till I was 13. And also, mm -hmm. honestly, even after that, like, it was always very hard for me to sleep by myself, because I was afraid of demons. And so to me, that the idea that anybody would want to believe that there's no protection, no, none whatsoever, not even the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can protect them from something that awful. I just, I don't know, maybe they need to watch The Exorcist or something. Maybe they haven't seen it. Like, you know, I mean, it's it's really nasty. I mean, it's a really, uh, it, it would, it, it is the sum of all fears when it comes to what we're scared of and when th things go bump in the night. I truly believe it's ultimately what we're afraid of is being possessed. I think that's like that innate primal fear. That's why we worry about seeing these things in our rooms and having having these you know bother us because it wouldn't be because they knock things over and 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 you know uh uh like appear as shadows on our walls it's something else we fear it's something they can do to us and i believe it's possession i think that's what we're afraid of so i think the idea that that there would be no hope and there'd be no protection and there'd be no such thing as safety from that even as a believer is you guys aren't thinking this through you know maybe mm -hmm. maybe you need to be possessed once so you can figure out how how cruel a fate that would be to condemn you to as a believer in the lord jesus christ and then to taunt you with in in different passages about how even casting one out you're really just setting yourself up for something worse like think about it guys it makes no sense and that's sure. not the character of god or jesus to do something like that and to leave us hanging like that right. to a fate right. in a lot of ways worse than death at least, mm. you know, a fate worse than the actual death part, not necessarily the, where you end up. But I mean, I, right. I mean, that's even, just that's right. so terrifying. Even to even be tormented. When, even James says, I think, uh, that even when we're tempted to sin, he he gives us a way out. So we have escape. Even, and even when we give yeah. into our own weaknesses, he he still gives us a way out. We can choose it, but to have no choice but to be demon possessed is just, it, yeah, totally counter to the character of God. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, lastly, now that my blood pressure has come back down, <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't, I just, I, I think part of it was the frustration at, at looking at some of this junk going on in the chat, which is, you know, okay, I like open, free expression. Um, I do. And so I'm very liberal with things, uh, in the chat and I didn't shut anybody out and block anybody, uh, but I've noticed a comment that I want to speak to because I don't like when people try to manipulate people. I don't like it. It's um, it's ugly and it shouldn't happen. Now, I don't know if this is coming from a position of something where the devil's playing with your mind and you want to operate in this whole pity type thing where you want uh, people to pity you. You know, people do this crap 
it, you know, it, it going back to my granola Christians again. All right. Uh, I don't want to be one of those. I've never wanted to be one of those. You shouldn't want to be one of those. But one of the things granola Christians will do is try to manipulate people. Now, I see a comment saying, you know, God bless. I'm not going to participate in any fellowship discussions anymore. Well, that's your right. That's your God-given choice. Because you don't like what we said. You don't like some of the things. We're having an open discussion. We invited you to make your argument. You made your argument. We uh deconstructed your argument based upon the scripture. And now you want to say, well, I'm mad at you and I'm going to take my ball and bat and go home. Well, that's your prerogative, but that's not going to generate growth. Growth for a mature person, for a mature believer is, is being confronted with, even if it's ugly an ugly reality and facing it head on and saying, now, what am I going to do about this? This got dropped in my lap. I'm going to have to deal with this. Children run away. Adults face the truth and they deal with the truth. So I'm going to put a challenge out to you because I think you're better than that. That's why I'm calling you out on. It. I think you're better than that. In fact, I know you are because I remember what your channel name used to be before whatever happened to you happened. And you were preaching a fierce gospel and you were right on the money. And what we're saying is that gospel that you're preaching does not connect with being demon possessed. They don't go together. And we're challenging you to figure out, go ahead, try to prove it to yourself how those two could possibly be connected. I think you're better than that. And if you want to leave and you want to go away mad, that's your prerogative. I didn't block you. I'll let you say everything you wanted to say tonight in the chat. But if you decide to leave, that's of your own volition. And I will keep you in my prayers because I don't wish you any ill. All we're doing is challenge people, challenging people with this broadcast tonight to sit down and examine the actual arguments that you're making for a believer to be demon possessed. And how does that co correlate with the revealed word of God in this new covenant? about the declarations of God manifest in the flesh named Jesus. How do they go together? And then where is the instruction in the scripture on how not to be if we could be? And then how to get the devil out? I mean, what if you was by yourself? You know, you'd be in a world of hurt then, I guess, if you couldn't go find somebody to cast it out. So. Just examine what we presented tonight. Why don't you do a, a little paper like they do in, in like legal fields? They'll do pros and cons, right? Just write down, here's the pros for the argument. Here's the cons. And if you go add up all the stuff that we listed, you're going to see it's pretty weak argument that these people can even make on a believer being demon possessed. In fact, I think we destroyed it. I don't think you can even find the con other than the devil himself lying. On that note, next week, you guys, we're we're off. We will not be doing a late night with Lisa and friends. I always try to be considerate of my friends here. They have families. They have lives. And to come on here and give their time and over three hours most nights on broadcast is a lot of time away from their life. And, you know, they uh, have to do what they need to do. And everybody needs a break and to refresh and regenerate and get back in there and be ready for the next battle. So uh, we're going to take a, a night off next week, and then we'll be back. Hopefully, I've invited Minister Fitz Houston and his lovely wife, Jonna, to come back, and we're going to continue our discussion on singleness and marriage because I'm getting questions from a lot of you out there on how you know Christian dating and or courting is supposed to work. And rather than just be firing back 100 emails, uh, I would rather just cover it and let people ask their questions in the chat, and then we can discuss it here on the broadcast so people can have an open record as to how they should conduct themselves and believer, as believers while courting and or then also some other issues and problems that happen in marriage. So we're going to be – he's already tentatively agreed to come back and, and discuss that with us, and I'm excited about it. So I thank you all for joining us tonight here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends. 
Thank you for taking the time. I hope you'll remember to share this broadcast. If you did like the work and effort that we put in as a labor of love tonight, please remember to give us a like on your way out the door. I appreciate uh, you guys all stopping by and taking the time to share your thoughts and make whatever arguments and presentations you made here in the chat. I thank you for the challenge. We enjoyed it. And I think that we did address them directly. So uh, please fire off any emails if you have at me uh, that you would like at, uh, at uh, four, the number four, the most high Jesus at protonmail.com. Com, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Please don't hit me with 100 questions at one time, one question at a time, please. I'm just one person. I don't have a field and an army of assistants to help me. And I'm not the Bible answer woman, but I'll do the best I can to help you. And I will always uh, pray for you if you do have a prayer request. Thank you again for joining us. And I hope to see you roughly two weeks from now, right back here on Late Night with Lisa and Friends. Blessings in Jesus' name. Good night. And good morning.